a special feeling to be number one. Everybody thought you were the best. That's a special moment, a special moment. And number one, that's just, that's, that's everything. You wait for that moment all your life to have your name called. Don't think that every basketball player does not watch the draft and one day say, hey, I want my name to be called. I want to walk across the stage. I don't think there's one guy who ever had forgotten when he was drafted. You will always remember that. You always have that. Because you always dreamed of being in the NBA. So when that moment comes and your name is called, you finally have arrived. And tonight, you've arrived at a place where childhood dreams will come true with the big city of New York as a backdrop. Some of the best young players in the world stand at the doorstep to the big time, the NBA. We welcome you to East Rutherford, New Jersey, and the home of the New Jersey Nets, Continental Airlines Arena. It is the 1996 NBA Draft, start to finish on TNT. Thanks for being with us tonight. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ernie Johnson. And you listen to the words of Magic Johnson, and he speaks with such passion, even though it happened 17 years ago when he was the number one pick of the draft. It means that much. It speaks volumes to the magnitude of this night, to the young players and to their families and to their schools and to their coaches, that tonight they could hear their names called, being one of 58 players chosen in the 1996 NBA draft. We are glad you're with us for four hours worth. Well, rounds one and two, two rounds in this draft, five minutes between picks in the first round, the lightning round, two minutes between picks in the second, the Knicks have three in the first round, the Heat and the Spurs, no selections, and 36 underclassmen are eligible for the draft. This is kind of an unnerving night at times if you are making the choices, and already we know that the Toronto Raptors are having their door knocked down by Minnesota and Milwaukee and Boston, wanting to get up to that number two spot. Isaiah Thomas apparently going to go with his gut right there at number two and pull the trigger on one of those choices. It's that kind of a night when it is draft night. What is the key, Hubie Brown? Well, I think you have to look, Ernie. It's a very deep draft. We're overloaded at the small forward and power positions, but you also have to look into the formula and say over 150 free agents, the most talent ever coming out as of July 1st. Also joining us tonight, the last time he was in this building, his Kentucky Wildcats were winning the national championship. Head coach of the Kentucky Wildcats, Rick Patino. Rick, a lot of folks coming out, a lot of kids coming out, childhood, not, a not too distant memory for some of these guys. What is the risk you take if you draft one of them? Well, it certainly is a risk because in three years you could possibly lose one of those picks, but Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Isaiah Thomas all came out early, and certainly we may have players at that level right now coming out. So great future lies ahead for these young men. Tonight is a lot like last year's draft in Toronto in that there is the specter of an NBA lockout hanging over the proceedings here on July 1 because there is still no collective bargaining agreement between the NBA and the Players Association. Let's get more on where things stand as far as that issue goes with two more of our colleagues here tonight, Greg Sager and Peter Vest the NBA NBC insider who's working with us tonight and they're with Russ Granick, deputy NBA commissioner gentlemen well we certainly don't want to spoil the party this is a night of celebration but we have to talk about the negotiations they broke off last night you went back to the table today is any progress being made well I think uh, some progress was made today we did meet for four or five hours and we're scheduled to meet again tomorrow but it's still too early to tell if we're getting anywhere or not should there be a lockout how does that impact the Olympics there are a couple guys that are there on this team that were dissidents in the decertification movement and four of these guys Shaquille O'Neal Reggie Miller John Stockton and now Gary Payton are free agents maybe they won't want to even play without an insurance policy or a contract well I don't think that Pete that it should affect the Olympics uh, I mean we uh, support USA basketball and the Olympic movement but that's an entirely separate institution from the NBA and, and I'd be surprised if any player said that they weren't ready to play for their country just because we have a labor dispute in the NBA. And I have not heard that from any of the players yet, and uh, I'm certainly hopeful that whatever happens uh, with the labor problems in the NBA, that we'll still have a dream team together. 
this just doesn't make sense. You had an agreement a year ago. The commissioner said yesterday the players reneged on certain issues. What are those issues? Well, there have been a number of issues. Uh, when they uh, brought in a new negotiator in February, who had been the person who had been trying to decertify the union last summer, he basically said he didn't feel obligated to live up to a lot of the cap rules that have been agreed to, to the fact that we had a group license agreement uh, allowing us to uh, continue to utilize player likenesses, uh, pension issues. There's a whole host of issues that they really turned the tables on once once uh, the new negotiator came in uh, in February. Well, it takes sacrifice and determination to make it in the NBA. Let's hope those same ideals carry over from the players we interview tonight to the negotiating table tomorrow. Ernie? All right, thank you very much, Craig Sager and Peter Vesey. Much more from those two as the night goes on. And the NBA commissioner, David Stern, is set now to tip off the proceedings here of the 1996 NBA draft. Let us go center stage to the commissioner. Good evening, and welcome to the 1996 NBA draft at the Continental Airlines Arena, home of the new New Jersey Nets. To our fans across North America, watching on TNT in the United States and YTV in Canada, thank you for joining us. And to our many fans gathered here today, thank you for your strong and enthusiastic turnout. Let's get started. The first pick in the 1996 NBA draft will be made by the Philadelphia 76ers, who have five minutes to make their selection. And so the clock is running on the Philadelphia 76ers as we begin the 1996 NBA draft. Throughout the night, you will hear from our correspondents who have got you covered coast to coast, conference by conference, division by division. Scott Hastings, one of the all-time great 12th men in the league, will be in Phoenix covering the Pacific Division. The Midwest Division is handled by Jim Durham in Dallas. The Central Division handled by my old buddy Cheryl Miller, who's up there at Gund Arena. And let's begin our rip around now of who our correspondents are with Kevin Kiley in Philadelphia. Thanks, Ernie. I'm at the Spectrum where I'll be tracking the Atlantic Division. Rumors abound here in Philadelphia. Will the 76ers keep the number one pick? Will they switch with Vancouver for the number three pick? Well, you can put all those rumors to rest. The president of the 76ers, Pat Croce, told me a short time ago they will keep the number one pick, and that clears the way for Allen Iverson to become a 76er. Let's go now to Cleveland and Cheryl Miller. Thanks a lot, Kevin. I'm here at Gund Arena, and I'll be covering all the action in the Central Division. Now, the Cavaliers have two picks in the first round, and according to Coach Mike Fratello, they're definitely looking for some big men. Let's go to Jim Durham. And Cheryl, here in Dallas, the Mavericks have had controversy all week surrounding the three Jays. They put that behind them. They look ahead to the ninth pick in the first round, and what have they got? Maybe three W's. They're looking at Lorenzen Wright, Samaki Walker, and John Wallace. The Mavericks, like the rest of the Midwest and the NBA, keeping their options open. Let's go to Phoenix and Scott Hastings. Thanks, Jim. I tell you what, the Pacific Division has all sorts of things going on. You've got a disgruntled point guard in Portland. They're trying to get rid of him. Golden State's trying to draft somebody we can't even pronounce their name. And will Charles Barkley be traded before the draft or after the draft? We'll answer those questions out here in Phoenix. Ernie, back to you. All right, Scotty. And, uh, geez, Golden State with a guy you can't pronounce. Could be uh, Ephemius <laughs> Rencius, Ildranus Iskalskis, and uh, uh, Vitaly Potapenko. Well, they are tough to pronounce, but all three of those guys should go somewhere in the first round. The number one pick, however, belongs to the Philadelphia 76ers. Much of the speculation, and as Kevin Kiley pointed out, uh, centering on Allen Iverson of Georgetown, the sophomore. Let's go to Peter Vesey now. And, Peter, any reason to think they'd go anywhere but Iverson? No, I think he has a pretty good source there in Mr. Croce. I talked to Brad Greenberg, the 76er general manager, a while ago. He loves Iverson for a number of reasons. He thinks he's the quickest guy in the draft, the fastest, the most competitive, the most mentally tough, the most persistent. In addition, he feels he is capable, very capable of running the team and making everybody happy. Other than that, Brad Greenberg isn't sure of the pick. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, guys, if you had to make the choice between Eric uh, Marbury, Stefan Marbury, and uh, Iverson, where do you go? Well, it comes down to stop. You have a new coach, you have a new
the new general manager, how are you going to play? You already have in cement Derek Coleman, you have Clarence Witherspoon, and then you have Stackhouse, three guys who score. It will come down to your philosophy. Here in New York, it's unanimous. It should be Marbury. <laughs> <laughs> Where I sit, I like Marcus Camby because of the style of play of having to wait for Derek Coleman to get down the floor. The X factor, Derek Coleman gets in great shape. you got three wonderful players with Iverson, Stackhouse, and Derek Coleman. There's been a lot of instability at the point for the Philadelphia 76ers since Maurice Cheeks left. And look at this list since 1989 of Johnny Dawkins and Hornacek, Ricky Green, Barrows, Tyler, Skiles, Maxwell, and the instant offense guy, Trevor Ruffin. Making the adjustment from the point in college to the point in the pros, how tough is that? Well, it's very difficult. First, starting with the defensive end, but Iverson and Marbury, two excellent defenders. Also, the 24-second clock, Ernie. You not only have to get the teams into their offensive sets, but you also have to be able to break the defensive down when that clock gets to four or five seconds. We are ready for the first pick of the 1996 NBA draft and to make the announcement, the commissioner, David Stern. With the first pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Philadelphia 76ers select Allen Iverson from Georgetown University. And there you see backstage Allen Iverson, the Georgetown sophomore. Ann and Steve, mom and dad. Family and friends back there. And what a tremendous moment that is for a kid. You think about all the nights, all the mornings that you had to get up early, take the kid to his youth league game, and dreaming of this night, of being the first pick in the NBA draft. And it has happened for Allen Iverson. His mom, and there is David Falk, who should figure prominently into the... He, he seems very happy. Yes, yeah. as a matter of fact. Can't hide that smile. Wearing the hat of the Philadelphia 76ers, Allen Iverson. And let's talk a little bit about the first pick by the Philadelphia 76ers, and even six foot, 167 pounds, and as quick as you can possibly want out of a player about to go into the NBA. Allen Iverson led the Big East in scoring with 25 points a game and in steals with better than three a contest. He was consensus All-American. He averaged nearly 28 points a game in the NCAA tournament. He played four games there. Had 10 steals in a game against Miami. The first player to ever leave Georgetown in the John Thompson era. He had good reason to do this. He has a sister who's ill, needs a specialist. Allen Iverson wants to help. You look at the strengths and the weaknesses. A lot of strengths. A big upside on this guy. What do you think? You'll be in Rick. Well, I think you also have to throw into the equation is the fact that he was defensive player of the year two times in the Big East. You know that with the basketball from end to end, there's no one in the league going to be quicker. Plus, you, you know because of the explosiveness that he can break you down from a defensive standpoint. And a major plus with this guy, he gets to the foul line. And uh, pretty good ups on the guy, too. And I have a feeling he hasn't come down yet, even though he is with our Craig Sager right now, Craig. All right, Alan, congratulations. Hubie Brown says there's nobody in the league quicker than you. Is there anybody that can stop you one-on-one? -on -one? I don't know. I, I hope not. And, um, I don't think so. You've pretty well been able to do whatever you want on the court in high school and in college. What have the Sixers told you they expect from you? Um, they just want me to come in and play my game. Um, you know, distribute the ball. There's great players already on the team. Stackhouse and Derek Coleman. Um, it would be crazy to think that I would come in and try to take all the shots uh, like I did at Georgetown. But um, I think we have a good game plan, and uh, we got a great coach and a great staff, and um, I'm looking forward to it. You mentioned great players. Derek Coleman obviously is one of them. If you talk to him, how do you get the best out of his game? I haven't talked to him, but, um, you know, they lost some games last year a lot, and uh, I know they want to just dig deep down the side and uh, bring everything out that they got and win some games. And all I want to do is win. And that whole staff and the organization, they just want to win. Congratulations. You're number one. All right. Thanks a lot. All right, Ernie. All right. There is 
His mom, Ann, and yeah, hanging on every word that Alan Iverson had to say. His first interview as a pro, you could say, talking to our Craig Sager. And that means that the last two picks of the draft have both been from Georgetown. Don Reed was the last pick last year. And now Alan Iverson, the first pick of the 96 draft. And Don Reed's success with Doug Collins and the Detroit Pistons points out, doesn't matter where you go, you can make an impact in this league. Alan Iverson definitely had an impact on the program at Georgetown, leaving after his sophomore year, leaving John Thompson with memories of a, tr a true fantastic point guard. He's an extraordinary athlete. Uh, I think that uh, the fact that he jumps well, he runs well, he's quick and fast. He is an intelligent person. Uh, he picks up very quickly and you know if Allen does not do something it's because he made the choice to do it not because of the fact that he does not understand and I think he's got a tremendous competitive heart. He is the sixth guard taken number one in the NBA draft the last one taken 1979 pretty good player Urban Magic Johnson. So the Philadelphia 76ers have a new look they have a new point guard let us go now to Kevin Kiley. Kevin. Thank you, Ernie. A lot of smiling faces here in Philadelphia. This is one of them, the new rookie head coach, Johnny Davis, former point guard yourself. I have to ask you, the character issue with Iverson, was it discussed? We certainly discussed it. We uh, evaluated, assessed uh, Allen Iverson as a person, and we're very satisfied with who he is. There's some concern that Iverson being so quick getting up and down the court that Coleman and Witherspoon will not get up and down the court with him. What's your feeling in coaching the team? Not a concern. Not a concern at all. Derek Coleman, Jerry Stackhouse, both basketball players, both willing to do whatever. They'll be able to get up and down the floor with Allen Iverson. You'll make sure they do. Now, what about the uh, point guard position? What is the most difficult thing for a point guard to learn? I think running the club, uh, learning which players like the ball where, uh, just being in command and authority of the game itself. I don't think Allen will have any problem making that adjustment all at right, all. Johnny. Well, congratulations to you and to the Philadelphia 76ers. Back to you, Ernie. All right, thank you, Johnny and Kevin. The Toronto Raptors on the clock right now. And you remember on national TV, Isaiah Thomas said, I've got my eye on Marcus Camby. He's the guy I want. Let's see if that is indeed the case as we go to Commissioner David Stern. With the second pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Toronto Raptors select Marcus Camby from the University of Massachusetts. Well, there's the guy Rick Pitino said should have gone first. He'll take number two, though. Marcus Camby of UMass. Coming out after his junior year, college player of the year, led UMass to the Final Four. In fact, face Rick Pitino's bunch right here at Continental Airlines Arena. Well, it's all based on needs and what a team needs, and certainly Allen Iverson has the ability to make the 76ers a, a great ball club. But this young man has what all NBA teams look for. He's a shot blocker. He's extremely quick. He has a great low post game, and if you try to double down on him, he finds all the open men. So this young man has fabulous potential, and Toronto really with Stoudemire and now Camby, they've got a great future that lies ahead. Yeah, the Raptors had the Rookie of the Year in Damon Stoudemire, Mighty Mouse, a year ago, and now they'll make their bid for that award again with Marcus Camby. There's his mom, Janice, backstage, and there's Big Marcus with Commissioner David Stern, who spends a lot of nights on draft night looking way up at some of the draftees. 6'11", 223 pounds out of UMass, a power forward, the College Player of the Year. And there is Marcus Camby. The great low post moves, as you point out, yes. Rick. Unfortunately, against our team. <laughs> <laughs> One of four players with 300 career blocks. He can get that done, too. Now, Ernie, what you have to look at this guy? This guy is one at every level, and he has the ability to carry the other four guys. He's a power forward. You match him up with Sharon Wright at the center position. At small forward, you have Tracy Murray, Carlos Rogers, Doug Christie, and then in the backcourt, you have Stoudemire. So four of your positions, you have young players and guys who can get the job done points-wise. The Minuteman goes to the Toronto Raptors with the second pick of the NBA draft, and Marcus Camby is with Craig Sager. Well, Marcus, first of all, after all that's happened the last few weeks, the moment has finally arrived. Any way to describe what you've had to go through? 
It's been difficult, but, you know, I had a lot of support back home from Hartford. And um, back home, was a lot of people didn't want to see Marcus Cameron succeed, but I had strong friends in my, my project, the penthouse in Bellevue Square. I had great support from the cartel back there in the back, and, um, you know, everything's been great. A lot of players, we say we have to wait to develop. You're ready to make an immediate impact. What position, your talents, where are they suited in the NBA? Um, people question, you know, what position I'll play at three, four, or five. Um, I can see myself just as a player. Just get me out there on the court and just let me play. Isaiah Thomas has proven he knows what he's doing. Last year, Damon Stoudemire. Have you met Damon? Have you played against Mighty Mouse? Oh, yeah. I met him in my work. We played one-on-one. -on -one. But um, he beat me 5-4, but I, I couldn't back him in. So, um, you know, he's a heck of a point guard. You know, any big man would love playing with Damon. Rookie of the year, two years in a row, maybe? Maybe. <laughs> All right, congratulations. Let's go back to the side. All right, and on the way, again, a look at Mom, Janice. Congratulations, your son, number two in the NBA draft. And he's also the second player from UMass picked in the first round ever. The other one, uh, oh, yeah, Dr. J, Julius Irving, 1972 by the Bucks, a guy sold on the talents of Marcus Camby. I think Marcus is a player with uh, tremendous uh, skills. Uh, his offensive skills are, are very, very good. He's, uh, he's won at every level that he's played at. Uh, as a high school player, he was a state champion. As a, a college player, his team took his team to the Final Four. On the defensive end of the court, he plays with a tremendous amount of passion. He blocks shots with a passion, helps his teammates, uh, talks while he's on the court. And uh, physically, he's willing to give up his body. So Marcus Camby, picked by the Toronto Raptors. Now the number three pick goes to the Vancouver Grizzlies. Let's see what's going on in the 3-4-5 area right now. Let's check in with Peter Vesey. Pete, what you got? Well, there's been some talk that the Grizzlies might take Stephon Marbury at this spot, but they're going to go for Sharim, Sharif Abdurrahim, and uh, they're going to keep him. They love this guy. Stu Jackson's in love with him. The Bucks will then go for Stephon Marbury. Mike Dunleavy loves him, but he could also be talked into trading him. The T-Wolves are already offering Andrew Lang and a flip-flop of picks. The Lakers have offered Vlade Divac. Mike Dunleavy wants Anthony Pielas thrown in there. The fifth pick is going to be Antoine Walker. Kevin McHale likes the guy, but I think they're going to take him. 75% sure they're going to trade them, trade him to somebody else. To you, Ernie. All right, thank you, Peter. The uh, complexion of the draft kind of changed a little bit with Sharif Abdul Rahim announcing he was coming back out. He said, first, I'm going to come out. Then he said, I'm going back to school. Now I'm coming back out. We could make his name Sharif Abdul. I'm not so sure, Rahim. <laughs> but he's back in there. And if uh, if you are the Vancouver Grizzlies, and I appreciate the chuckle there, Hubie, what do you do right here? No, I, I think he is a terrific talent. Uh, I had an opportunity to see him in high school, and then you saw what he just did this year at the University of California. We're just saying 6 10 he can run the floor with anyone he handles has an excellent game facing he can rebound and block shots first five picks in his draft to me I look down the road and I see five all-stars every year you look at the draft and you wonder could this person be a potential all-star this young man definitely is a potential all-star the Vancouver Grizzlies have the number three pick let's go to the stage and Commissioner David Stern for the announcement With the third pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Vancouver Grizzlies select Sharif Abdur Rahim from the University of California. The earliest a freshman has ever gone in the NBA draft, Sharif Abdur Rahim, a high schooler in Marietta, Georgia, played his freshman year, his only year of college ball at the University of California. Fives all around backstage as the Cal freshman makes his way to meet Commissioner David Stern. The Pac-10 Player of the Year is a freshman. And the first freshman since Cliff Robinson in 1978 to lead the conference in scoring. Amina Abdul Rahim, his mother, with the tears. You see a lot of that backstage on draft night. Six ten, two hundred and twenty-five pounds, Sharif Abdur Rahim. 
The third pick in the NBA draft goes to the land of the big country, the Vancouver Grizzlies. And his skills, obvious, you Yeah, they, they needed a power forward to play with Reeves. They have a number of players that can play small forward. Their guards are adequate. But what they need is a dominant guy who can board, block shots, get out on the break, fill the lane. He has all of those qualities, plus he's excellent off the dribble facing. And Greg Anthony at the point had a terrific year. So now you've got you've got your legitimate center, you've got your power forward, could also swing it to three. So you've got a great start for the Vancouver Grizzlies. And he's probably breathing a little easier as Greg Anthony now that Eric Mar or I keep wanting to call him Eric like his brother's name, Stefan Marbury, not taken by the Vancouver Grizzlies. Todd Bozeman was the coach at Cal for Sharif Abdul Rahim. He knew he had a gem there, but he also knew this wasn't gonna last. Todd Bozeman. I can't say I really expect him to be here for four years. Um, I didn't expect that when I recruited him. So, um, you know, and people ask that question all the time. And, you know, the thing is, is, you know, you would look at a kid like that as being a, a Mercedes. And if someone said, hey, you know, you can drive this Volkswagen for five years or you can drive this uh, Mercedes for one year, you know, say, hey, I, I know I'm going to have to give it up after a year, but give me the Mercedes. I'll drive the Mercedes for a year. He didn't have a chance. Well, the Mercedes for a year, but now you're right here heading to the NBA. A year ago, debating between Cal and Georgia Tech, this time college and the NBA. What influenced your decision? Well, I felt like I was in a situation where I could um, really put my family in a better situation, put myself in a better situation, you know, just fulfill a lifetime dream. And I um, just opted to go ahead and do that. A great talent. That's the comment from Hubie Brown. Rick Patino says a future all-star. Your game. You're versatile, you do everything. What position, how do you think you fit in? Well, you know, I'm just ready to go in and play whatever position um, Vancouver wants me to play. Three, four, whatever they want me to do. I just want to um, come in and contribute and win basketball games. A lot of hugs, a lot of kisses, some tears of joy from your mama Mina back there, too. What does it mean to your family? I mean, it means so much because um, I guess I look at it, if I work, they work, and they've just been with me for so long and um, trying to get to this point. So. It's, it's, it's just a um, big moment for us. Okay, congratulations. Let's go back to Ernie. All right, Craig. Three picks down in the first round here at Continental Airlines Arena. The Milwaukee Bucks are up. We'll be back to tell you where the Bucks go after this. Welcome back to the 1996 NBA Draft. In 1985, the big fella, Patrick Ewing, was the first pick overall out of Georgetown. Tonight, Allen Iverson became the second. Georgetown became the seventh school to have two number one picks. Right now, Milwaukee is up. Let's go to the podium and Commissioner David Stern. With the fourth pick in the 1996 NBA Draft, the Milwaukee Bucks select Stephon Marbury from Georgia Tech University. And pandemonium reigns backstage. Got to seal Vince Cellini's line, the traveling Marbury. He's got a family of basketball players. And I can recall as a Cub radio reporter in 1970s, covering his brother Eric Marbury, Sky Dog, they called him at the University of Georgia. And Stefan Marbury, really living a dream for that entire family, hoping that somebody would make an impact in the NBA, get their name called on this night. And there is Stefan Marbury. It's not just moms who shed a tear on this night. The Milwaukee Bucks take Stefan Marbury, 6'2", 182, out of Georgia Tech. Played one year for Bobby Crimmins. He was all ACC, scored about 19 points a game. He was number five in assists in the ACC, the ACC Rookie of the Year. Only the fifth freshman selected to the first team all ACC, Joe Smith, Kenny Anderson, have done that. But Marbury may be 
I guess he will be. As far as point guards go in this league, and maybe you compare him to his predecessors like Kenny Anderson at that place, the best of the bunch. Well, he has a great feel for the game. He gets everyone involved. He not only can score, shoot the threes, he's an excellent defender, and then he can make the pass in traffic. Stefan Marbury is taken by the Milwaukee Bucks, number four overall in the first round, and he is standing by now with Craig Sager. Craig? Well, Stefan, it's always an emotional scene in the back room there when you get drafted. But I tell you, when we saw your family sitting there hugging everybody, the tears coming to your mother Mabel's eyes, tears coming down your face. Did anybody in your family sleep last night? What was it like? I can't even, I can't even explain the way I feel right now. It's been 20 years. 20 long years. You ready for this day? It's here. It's here now. Yeah. Can I take your head off a second? What has this been talked about in your family? What has it been like? I mean, you, you sit around a long time, effortless effort nights, nice, just sitting there thinking about when that day was going to come. And for it to be here now, it just feels so good. I can put a permanent smile on my mother's face. Also buy her that greenhouse for her plant. Oh yeah, she gonna have that nice big greenhouse. <laughs> of course. Last night we talked about the NBA. We said New York has leaders, politics, point guards. What does an NBA point guard mean to you? What's the definition? A leader, a person that's gonna make everyone around him better, sacrifice, do everything that it takes to win. Well, the Marberries have arrived. Nice talking to the Starberry. Congratulations. Good luck, Ernie. Well, that's what the NBA draft is all about, isn't it, folks? The emotion overcoming Stephon Marbury taken in the first round by the Milwaukee Bucks. He's the first Georgia Tech point guard to lead the team in scoring since Mark Price. An inside look to first Hubie Brown, an inside look at what he is able to do on the court, his quickness. Well, you're going to see him uh, come down the floor here right now and change directions quickly and come right into traffic behind the back, the quick move, and now the big step. Now, once he gets down in here, he has the ability to make the pass in traffic, finding the free people, making everyone a better player. There's also tears of joys out there in Milwaukee from Vin Baker and Glenn Robinson <laughs> yeah. because now they've got someone, although Sherman Douglas is an excellent point yes. guard, they've got someone who can not only defend but get them the ball consistently off penetration. How about the Minnesota Timberwolves? They're on the clock now with about a minute and a half to go in their five-minute span to make a pick. Where do you go if you're the Timberwolves, Hubie? Well, there, there's a number of ways. I mean, you, you say, well, at the forward position, you already have Garnett and Gugliotta. You have Lang at the center. But it's like what Peter said up on top. We have no idea what is going on behind the scenes now. They might draft someone here, and that person is going someplace else. Uh, you have no idea what they have in their formula. Let's check in with our correspondent on the Midwest Division. That is Jim Durham in Dallas. What's up with Minnesota? I tell you what, Ernie, uh, as you know, the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves were guard shopping uh, going into this draft. They had hoped to perhaps trade up and get a Marbury, or perhaps maybe they'll trade down and get someone else. But uh, as Peter Vesey said earlier, it would appear that Antoine Walker would be their pick there. Now, there's an interesting uh, sidebar to this issue. When he went to Minnesota to have the workout, he went one-on-one -on -one with John Wallace. And... Um, I understand Coach Patino, uh, Antoine Walker won. <laughs> Maybe you can address that. What do you think, Rick? Well, you know, Antoine Walker is a terrific basketball player. I, I, he's, he's, I think, going to be in five years one of the best players in this draft. Uh, I'm not sure he's going to Minnesota, certainly, but uh, that remains to be seen. Peter said they, that they might trade him. I hope they trade him back to Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. Let's go down to the podium of the commissioner, David Stern, with Minnesota's pick at number five. <laughs> with the fifth pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Minnesota Timberwolves select Ray Allen from the University of Connecticut. So the parade of underclassmen continues here in the first round. Ray Allen, the junior, out of UConn. Bit of a surprise here, guys. Or does this tell us something about what Minnesota might be thinking in the J.R. Ryder position? Well, yeah, you have uh, J.R. Ryder. You also have Doug West, 
two excellent players. Doug West can play small forward as well as the two guard position. And that's why we say uh, we have no idea what Kevin McHale is doing. And we also know that Kevin McHale is brazen and it also will get out there and he's been very creative since he has become the head of the basketball operations. Yes, but this is not what they need. They were looking at the point guard center position and they draft a great shooting guard. So this looks like it may be a, a trade in the works or he just is very happy with Ray Allen. Right? Yeah, the, yeah, there sure was a lot of talk earlier about Minnesota coveting Steve Nash, also a point guard. So we'll see what happens here down the road. But Ray Allen is their pick. Number five in the first round, 6'5", 198, and the Big East Player of the Year, 23.4 points a game. He was second to Allen Iverson in the conference in scoring. UPI's National Player of the Year. He knocked down some three-pointers, too. Hit 47% to lead the Big East, and his 115 threes on the year was a UConn record question about whether he'd be able to take some guys off the dribble is that a legitimate concern about what he can do oh that's a that's a major concern except he has range Ernie and this draft you're looking for guys who can make the outside shots he, he's a, an excellent three-point shooter he's a good kid and he's a terrific finisher in the open floor a husky goes to the Timberwolves the number five pick overall in the first round and Ray Allen is with Craig well, Ernie, this is kind of a surprise. Everywhere that Ray Allen interviewed, he made a very favorable impression. Everybody loved him. Senator Cole wants him to run his campaign. I asked him where he was going. He said you didn't know. And here you picked by a team where you didn't even interview. It's very interesting because uh, Danielle Marshall went to Minnesota, and I never thought I'd make, make it to Minnesota, but Minnesota's a great city, and they have a great organization, and I'll be ready to play there next year. I talked to you in Chicago. You came off Player of the Year honors, had a great season, but you said you had to work on all aspects of your game. Why? Well, because going to the NBA, I think I have to step it up a notch everywhere. Um, I can't settle for settle for the skills that I displayed in college. I think the NBA is another level, and I definitely have to improve a lot and work very hard. Well, this is a moment brought your whole family together. Yes, it has, and um, it's great to see my mother, my father, all my sisters, and my daughter back in the green room having a good time together. Okay, good luck. Let's go back to Ernie. There is Flo Allen, Ray's mom. Go ahead, smile. It's all right. The number five pick in the first round. And there is Walter Allen, Ray's dad. An inside look now at Ray Allen, Hubie. And we've talked about his ability to shoot from the outside, deadly from three-point range, and see if that translates into the pros. Well, that that is definitely his strong suit. He has the ability to come off the screens, make the catch, and then have the range. He does not need the dribble to make the three-pointer. Uh, that is key at the NBA level. Plus, what you like is the athletic ability, and he's very coachable. Ray Allen, the number five pick in the draft, taken by the Minnesota Timberwolves. The Boston Celtics are up next. We'll be back as the draft continues after this. And welcome back to Continental Airlines Arena, East Rutherford, New Jersey, in the 1996 NBA Draft, continuing here on TNT. If you're just joining us, we are in the first round. We are up to pick six. The Boston Celtics have it. If you're Boston, what are you thinking right now, Hubie? Well, you have to say, all we have right now, we lost Derek Montrose in a trade. All you have at the center position is Purvis Ellis, and everyone else is a free agent. But the small forward position, you have Antoine Walker. Now, you can move Rick Fox to the backcourt, play Eric. Eric Williams and Antoine Walker. Boston moving from number nine to number six with the trade with Dallas. Celtics are now ready, and so is the commissioner. With the sixth pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Boston Celtics select Antoine Walker from the University of Kentucky. I wish we had somebody on the set who knew something about this guy. <laughs> oh, we do. Rick, how's it make you feel to see this guy go? Uh, this young man came out a, a, a brash high school young man and was the key to our championship. His maturity level and advancement was sensational. I'm so happy he's drafted by Boston. I was kind of hoping for Boston, the Clippers, or New Jersey. I felt they, they needed him the most. He can play power forward, small forward, can even bring it up and play a little point forward. Bittersweet at all for you, though? Oh, I'm so happy for him. This young man helped us win a championship, made all our dreams come true. Now, now they're crying backstage, the family, and everybody in Kentucky, including myself, are crying for other reasons we, because we hate to see this young man leave us. Any weakness in his game, do you feel? No, I really feel he's improved defensively. He can play both. What well, people don't realize, he can play a little power forward. He has a great post-up game. Has to become a little bit more consistent shooter. 
but a great, great competitor. Wants to beat you at a game of horse. Nice anticipation he also has, you know, in the final four, in the semifinal game, and in the finals, four steals in each of those games. The guy has quickness and smarts on the court, and Antoine Walker on his way to the Boston Celtics. There you see the bio on him, 6'10 and 234. Take me through his game, Coach. Well, he's got a great low post game, much improved. He reminds me of Magic Johnson in the open floor, and they have the graphic at 6'10. We recruited him at 6'8. Somewhere at the end of the championship to the draft in Chicago, he grew 10, 2 inches. That's <laughs> how much potential this young man has. But he does have a terrific all-around game. The Boston Celtics got themselves a great, great, potentially, basketball player because of the way he can score and pass. Just 19 years old right now will turn 20 on August 12th. Antoine Walker picked by the Boston Celtics, and he's with Craig Singer. All right, first of all, Rick Patino, he's up there raving about your talents, talking about how great you were, what you did for Kentucky. Why couldn't he talk you into staying? He tried. I mean, I, um, Coach knew it was best for me. The best situation for me was to come out right now. And, uh, you know, he, he, he bagged me 100%. He only played you 23 minutes a game. What happens now when you go to a 48-minute game with a 24-second shot clock? It's very difficult to play 30 minutes in our system. Uh, 23 minutes is a, is a long time in our system. You know, it's going to be a big adjustment for me going to the NBA, but I feel very confident in making that adjustment. On behalf of Larry Bird, who had a lot to do with your selection and all the Celtic fans, Compliments on the tailor, the green. It looks good on you already. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I, guess, I guess I made the right decision. And, uh, shoes, I, didn't, I didn't have no idea I was going to the Celtics, but I feel very happy and, and with them picking me. Celtic green is here, Kentucky blue. Sorry, Rick, it's gone. <laughs> Yeah, when the college days are over, he's into the pros now, and he must have known something. Where in the green, Antoine Walker goes to the Boston I, I, Celtics. I think he was putting on the green for the color of money, Ernie. I didn't know. Yeah, there, the you Celtics. Go. there you go. If, if that were the case, there'd be a lot of green suits in here tonight. <laughs> Next up, it's the L.A. Clippers. Let's go to our correspondent on the Pacific Division in Phoenix. That is Scott Hastings. What's up with the Clips, Scotty? Well, Ernie, I know you're dying to know what's going up with the Clips. Little, little news. Rick Pitino just said it. Ray Allen, look for him to be traded. Some people speculate Portland, but look Look for him to go to Milwaukee, or not, yeah, to Milwaukee for Stephon Marbury, or in Minnesota we'll get Marbury, and, and something else will be given a lot of our stuff. But those two, Ray Allen and Marbury, should be exchanged either today or sometime in the near future. Watch that. As far as the Clippers, what do they know? Since '85, they've had seven lottery picks, only one guy's on the team. Since '82, they've had 13 first-round players chosen, only two are on the team. Uh, right now, Bill Fitch has locked his assistant coaches out of the war room, not letting them uh, give any advice at all. He likes. Potapinko. I said that correct, Ernie. Aren't you proud of me? Uh, another guy, Dampier, is somebody they like. And look maybe for Kerry Kettles. He was really impressive in, uh, in their workouts. Well, if you're a marketing guy and he goes to the Clippers, you got Kittles and Fitch. Wouldn't that be nice? Anyway, thank you very much, Scott Hastings, for the report from Phoenix on the Pacific Division. Let's go now to Peter Vesey. What's your take on what Scotty had to say and what else are you hearing, Peter? I, I think he's got something there. Uh, when, you, when you're making predictions like I am, I was always taught you got to have a cover story. So they <laughs> definitely got something going. Uh, they're not, they didn't draft him to keep him. They need a point guard. So it's either going to be for Marbury, but I suspect it's for Rod Strickland out in Portland. Portland. Uh, I think the Blazers really need that shooting guard and and uh, Kevin McHale had no one else to give him. As far as the Clippers go, I believe they're going to go for Lorenzo Wright. Brian Williams is a free agent. They must have insurance in case they can't re-sign him. As for the Nets in the next slot, I think they're going to go for Kerry Kittles. But if they've got the courage, I know John Calipari loves Kobe Bryant. Go for it, John. <laughs> <laughs> I assume that John is watching and if not, we'll certainly pass the word along to him that Peter says Kobe Bryant is the guy to go to. Isn't that, it easier when you're sitting on a set? <laughs> oh, believe me. And if he doesn't pick Kobe, the post is killing him tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> or not being locked out of a war room on draft night. How's that for what's going on with the Clippers? What do you, what do you see if you're Bill Fitch here, and what do you need out in L.A.? Now, the fact that they have to look at the situation with Brian Williams. Stanley Roberts is, is an excellent player if he's healthy, but he has never been healthy since he's been there. If Brian Williams goes, they have to protect themselves with someone who can play the center position. They're talking about Lorenzen Wright. Is that a possibility? What's your thoughts on it? I think so right now, but this is a tough pick. This is the toughest pick so far because this now it gets a little touchy. Well, I talk about the L.A. Clippers, and on paper, these guys look pretty good because you've got a lot of guys who went high in the draft, nine top 15s. There's Bones up there at the top who won the slam dunk. Brent Berry, Lamont Murray, Piatkowski, Rogers, DeHare, Seeley, Brian Williams, Loy Vaught, and Pooh Richardson. Who will the Clippers add to that list? Let's go down to the commissioner, David Stern.
And obviously, Commissioner David Stern not quite ready for the Clippers, whose time has expired. They are set to go. Who else? Or again, let's just dissect what the Clippers need, what Bill Fitch does here. And you look at the list of players they have had who have been pretty high draft choice. Well, yeah, you look at Potipenko, then you also have Dampier, and then you have Lorenzo Wright. It comes down to which guy you like the best. The commissioner is ready, as you With see. With the seventh pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Los Angeles Clippers select Lorenzo Wright from the University of Memphis. Well, the record continues here on draft night. That's seven underclassmen in a row to start off the draft. Lorenzen Wright of Memphis, the latest. His dad is Herb. He's the head women's coach at Shelby State Community College in Memphis. Played some pro ball in Finland. His mom, Deborah. And Lorenzen Wright, the 6'11", 225-pound sophomore out of Memphis. The seventh pick in the first round by the Los Angeles Clippers. You know that at the center position, Ernie, he only goes at 230 pounds. They're going to have to bulk him up if he's going to play there. Uh, you know that that Clipper team plays an awful lot of close games. They've improved. They have a lot of first-round picks. They, they play with a passion. But what they need is someone to get them over the hump in the last two minutes. The people who can get the shot block, get the key rebound. But once again, they're adding another quality type of a guy. But for people to think that he's going to step in and overpower guys at only 6'11", 230, no, he needs to change his body. Uh, he needs to go in the weight room. But this is a great addition. Bill Fitch did just a wonderful job with this Clipper team last year. And this young man has great upside. He, he, like Marcus Camby, he's got to live in the weight room. That's got to be a big, big offseason for him. There's been a question mark, too, about a stress fracture with this guy, too. How much of a concern is that, you? Yeah, well, the main thing is, is, you know, where is the stress fracture? And then also, what are the doctors predicting? They're saying that he's going to be in a cast for six weeks. It happened in a pickup game. But no one questions this guy's talent. He is a hard worker. He gets after it. The coaches love them there. No one says that this guy doesn't give it to you night in and night out. Around Memphis, they called him the howl for the noise he made on the two-hand two -hand tomahawk jam. And now the howl is coming to the NBA in the L.A. Clipper uniform. He's with Craig Sager. Well, first of all, Lorenz, and the extent of the injury, I know obviously you don't feel it's serious. What have the doctors told you? What did the Clippers tell you? Well, the um, doctors all told me that, um, that I'll be all right and it'll heal on its own. Only thing I have to do is take my time off and get prepared and get ready to play. And um, by the time of the season, I'll be ready to play and, you know, I'm going to work hard. Where you come from has a lot to do with the player you become. Memphis, a hotbed for basketball. What was it like growing up? What, what do you feel about that city? Well, there's a lot of good players that's coming out of Memphis. And still is coming out of Memphis now. A bunch of a bunch of guys are coming out of high school. Tony Harris to name a few. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a basketball city. What do you think about the Clippers? I think they have a, a very good team. I'm going to work hard for them and try to win a championship down there. Work hard, that's the key. Hubie Brown says nobody works harder than you. You can't get a better compliment. Good luck. All right, thanks. I appreciate it. Ready? All right, six. Anna May Wright, that is uh, Lorenzo Wright's grandmother. Yeah, get the tissues out. Big night as Lorenzo Wright has taken the seventh pick by the Los Angeles Clippers. His coach in college at Memphis was Larry Finch. Let's hear from Larry Finch on the kind of player he had in Lorenzo Wright. 6'11", 11, can run the floor like a deer, like a little man. He got the quickness of a little guy. Um, just plays just plays hard all the time he's relentless when he goes out on the floor he just gets after it all the time and, and and this is one of the things that the professional teams like about him because he brings a lot of energy to a program it's what i love about having him here i wish they had him back <laughs> yes i bet he does and so we have reached the number eight pick in the first round and it's uh, the New Jersey Nets, and you can feel kind of a buzz going through the arena here at Continental Airlines Arena. You see the time on the AT&T draft clock coming down to two minutes to go. And we talked about the possibilities for John Calipari here. Would he have the guts to take uh, a kid like Kobe Bryant? What are your thoughts? Well, it's not the guts. We all know Kobe Bryant's going to be a great player. But what I learned a long time ago about the NBA when I said this to Ubi Brown as his assistant, I said, you before five years down the road, we're going to have ourselves a great basketball player. He said, kid, 
let's win next year. Let's not worry about four or five years. We don't know where we're going to be. So I think he's got to go with Kerry Kittles because he has to win and shoot right away, and he's got a four-year basketball player. Let's talk about the strengths and the needs of the New Jersey Nets and new head coach John Calipari. Well, Ernie, they have to improve their shooting, okay? Their shooting is right at the bottom of the league. They have the rebounding and shot blocking here. Kendall Gill hopefully will be healthy for them next year. If you go with Kittles or Kobe Bryant, you're adding another perimeter shooter, but most of all, a three-point shooter. When you have inside power guys, you must complement them with the range factor. you got to point out the fact that Sean Bradley came to this team and did a tremendous job, and now they're trying to add to that mix. They've had a lot of guys going after Sean Bradley. They're saying now teams know enough to not ask about the Storm and Mormon. Let's go to the commissioner for the next pick. With the eighth pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the New Jersey Nets select Kerry Kittles from Villanova University. Well, if you're John Calipari, you got to like what you hear in your own arena right here. Fans seem to like that one. Well, they know that they're getting a proven score. They had an opportunity to watch him play in the Big East here in this building against Seton Hall. So you know that you get a guy who's been able to put up over 30 points and over 35 points on some nights. Now, is he an unselfish player? Yes. Can he score in the open floor? Great quickness, finishing ability, and he's got range. And a good defensive player, good size. You can't post him up. He's a legitimate 6'5", 6 and he fits the needs of the New Jersey Nets. Their weaknesses, they can't shoot from the perimeter. He opens up the inside game and stops the double downs. Most fans came prepared, thinking Kerry Kittles might be the first pick of the New Jersey Nets, and there you see... Another Villanova the graduate, Rory Sparrow. <laughs> <laughs> and for the first time, the New Jersey fans get a look at their first round pick, Kerry Kittles. And some hopeful Nets fans with Calipari in New Jersey, a perfect fit. Kerry Kittles, only 177 pounds, but tall at six foot five, playing the two guard. Lawrence Moten of Syracuse and Ray Allen of UConn join this guy, the only Big East players to rank in the top 15 in seven statistical categories. Kind of tells you about the versatility of Kerry Kittles. As you look at his form, you can see he can release the ball quickly. He's got excellent rotation, excellent technique. This young man fits really well for the New Jersey needs, as we just stated. Now, obviously, he's going to have to get stronger physically for the NBA because he'll get punished in the low post if he doesn't. Hubie, there have been comparisons, I guess, to Scottie Pippen and to Reggie Miller and to Del Curry. Where does this guy fit in? Who does he remind you of? I, I think he should just try to be Curry Kittles, you know, <laughs> with, with a pro game. Let's stop putting him, you know, into the all-star every year category. But, once again, the quickness is there. So he has size, quickness, and like Rick says, he can defend in the post area, and then you have a perimeter game. That's what they're looking for here. When you have Bradley, and if they re-sign Gilliam, Jason Williams, you don't have to worry about the shot blocking and rebounding. New Jersey is always in the top three in all three categories. Gary Kittles, the first senior to be picked in the 1996 draft, and it comes at the number eight spot in the first round. Gary Kittles is with Greg Sick. Well, it may have been the eighth pick, but obviously it's the most popular choice here at the Meadowlands. First of all, who are all these people with Kerry Kittle signs? Some of my family from New Orleans and, and Florida. Everybody just came to support me today. It's a big day for me and my family. We've seen you have big days in this arena. There are some nights when you throw that ball, it just goes in. Other nights, you don't have that luck. What's it like to be in that zone, and how do you play in this building? You know, it's, it's great to be in that zone. You know, all players love to, love to have that feeling going for them, their shots falling, you know, and they get into rhythm. And playing here in the Millens is great for me. You know, being down the street from Philadelphia, Villanova, and my family, and, you know, it's just great to be in this kind of area, in this environment. 
obviously the Nets need a shooting guard. Have you had a chance to talk to some people around here, some of your teammates I see in the stands, like Sean Bradley and a couple others, Jason Williams? You know, I haven't spoken with them yet, but you know, Coach Kyle Perry spoke to me on many occasions and told me, you know, hey, you know, you're the guy we're looking to bring in. You know, hopefully you can add, to, you know, what we need and, you know, have the right attitude and, you know, make things happen here in New Jersey. Most popular choice so far of the night, Gary Kittles to the Nets. Ernie? Thanks, thanks, as you might expect here at Continental Airlines Arena. And we'll be back here as the NBA draft continues right after this. And we're about an hour deep into the 1996 NBA draft here on TNT. We have gone through eight picks. The number nine pick belongs to the Dallas Mavericks. The Mavs are up. After just seeing New Jersey pick Kerry Kittles, and here's Commissioner David Stern. With the ninth pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Dallas Mavericks select Samaki Walker from the University of Louisville. A bit best lit of the night, without question so far, belongs to Samaki Walker. <laughs> The Louisville Cardinals sophomore, another early entry candidate. So nine picks have been made, eight have been early entries. And Rick Pitino, you're saying this is a guy maybe underrated in some circles. Very much so. This is a great pick. Matter of fact, I called him just three, four weeks ago and told him it was a great idea for him to come out uh, right after Denny Crum called Antoine Walker. So this is a... <laughs> <laughs> this is really a terrific pick. Samaki so Walker is because we haven't seen a lot of him uh, because of some of the problems that, that went on this year for him. This is a great pick for Dallas. It fits their needs along with the rebounding, strong, bulky player they need inside. Yeah, they need a physical force, Ernie. This guy is a legit 6'9", 240 pounds, can play two positions for you because of the bulk factor. He has a low power inside game and an excellent shot blocker. He averaged 15 points a game, seven and a half rebounds in 21 games, as you mentioned, missed 10 because of an NCAA investigation. He did record the only triple-double in school history. And by golly, it came against uh, yes, we didn't get Kentucky. Any, we didn't get anywhere near the rim that night. He just kept blocking it. Yeah. He really is a, an outstanding prospect. I think, I think Dallas made a great pick here. I think he's going to prove to be exactly what they need. See, Dallas has to shore up the defense, Ernie. They've got to get more. Uh, they've got to get bigger with bulk inside and guys who can hold their area defensively. This was a good pick. Among the things that Dallas is trying to get done right now, some turmoil in Big D in the past week with Jim Jackson and the rest. But Samaki Walker is the pick of the Mavs, and he's with Craig. Well, when Hubie Brown says this guy doesn't have to change anything, I say congratulations to the <laughs> Dallas Mavericks. First of all, what do you expect to accomplish in your rookie year? Um, first of all, I like to accomplish. There's a lot of young guys coming out, and uh, I think there's a lot of speculations with people thinking that, you know, we have a lot to prove, which is true. I like to come out and show that I can come in and help the Dallas organization on and off the court, be a role model, be mature. Uh, coming out early, there's a lot uh, to prove, and I want to be the guy that they can prove on and count on to help make the Dallas organization a better program and help make and represent the league. People around the league were raving about your workouts. Did you have a good one in Dallas? What do you remember? What was it like? Uh, after uh, talking to them, they think I really had a good workout, and uh, they were pretty impressed, and um, I guess they thought so. Uh, so I guess I'm here, which I'm happy to be. I'd like to thank the Dallas organization. You left your derby hat before you met with the commissioner. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Mavericks now, so this is uh, it's more important. All right, congratulations. Back to the set. And you saw his mom, Patricia, backstage, Samaki Walker, picked by the Dallas Mavericks. Let's go to our Midwest Division correspondent, Jim Durham, who is in Dallas. Jim, what's up? Tell you what, Ernie, I've got Jim Clemens here with me. Samaki Walker, the pick of the Dallas Mavericks. This is a Dallas pick, I take it. It's a Dallas pick. We're very happy with our choice and the selection, and uh, we're anxious to have him here. Of the players that you considered, uh, what did you like about Walker? Well, I think Samaki will bring to the table a little bit of versatility. He's big, he's strong, he's more athletic. He'll, have, he'll get time to grow. People around the country, of course, are still concerned with the three J's issue. Uh, what's the uh, public posture today? Well, uh, we're looking forward to adding Samaki to our roster. We think that the three J's will show up and play, and uh, we're going to be very competitive next season. Are the Mavericks going to be involved in the trade wins before the draft is over? Well, I think we're going to stay competitive in the marketplace and anything subject to happen. 
All right, Jim Clemens, let's go back to EJ. All right, J.D. and Jim Clemens, thank you very much for your time out there in Dallas where Samaki Walker is the pick of the Dallas Mavericks. Now the Indiana Pacers are next, and Hubie Brown, this is a team that's really in transition, and there's some uh, some question marks. Of course, Reggie Miller's a question mark, Antonio and Dale Davis, and you made a couple of trades. Mark Jackson is gone. What is your, what is your feeling on Indiana? Well, I think Indiana must protect themselves so that in case they lose one of the Davis boys, you have to have a quality guy size wise at that position to either back up Rick Smith's or play the power forward position you know the uh, the Ricky Pierce thing did not work out he's gone Mark Jackson gone you pick up Jalen Rose in there unfulfilled potential right now for Jalen Rose on that Indiana yeah well Jalen Rose can play a number of three positions small forward two guard point guard but more important they probably play him at the three if they play him at the three you brought in Reggie Williams also in that trade that gives you a shooter to come in as a backup two guard a guy who has three point range and that was a that was a good choice uh, but now if you're if you're Larry Brown and you're looking at this you have got to protect yourself with size and strength the tenth pick in the NBA draft belongs to the Indiana Pacers let's go to the commissioner with the tenth pick in the 1996 NBA draft the Indiana Pacers select Eric Dampier from Mississippi State University the first center selected in the 1996 NBA draft Eric Dampier of Mississippi State another guy that Rick Pitino will know quite well very from Kentucky's very, battles with Mississippi State very strong powerful basketball player certainly uh, surprises me a little bit with the pick uh, what remains to be seen they need they need backup help obviously physically what you just mentioned but this young man is powerful very strong weakness obviously is not going to shoot great from the foul line but they made themselves an excellent pick now how do they fit him into their system that's a good question how do you do it well first of all Rick Smith's never plays during the 82 games never plays more than 28 to 30 minutes you still have to fill in here now you know another 18 to 20 minutes every night now if you lose one of the Davis boys you have got to have a quality body because Indiana does not want to fall to the bottom of that division this is a team that's talking with a lot of pride they thought if they were healthy at playoff time totally healthy that they could have been in the Eastern Conference Finals Eric Dampier big number 25 from Mississippi State questions on his offensive skills but not about his heart not about his ability to rebound block some shots inside Eric Dampier going to the Indiana Pacers as we uh, he makes a top 10 the 10th pick in the NBA draft and the big fella is with Greg. Well, so often we speculate about where the players can get drafted. I talked to you. Indiana was never mentioned. Are you surprised? Yeah, it's a big surprise to me. You know, I ain't never. It's clear to know what to expect, you know. And uh, Indiana's a real good team. You know, I'm looking to take a lot to the team and do as much as I can. Maybe we'll get a couple extra wins. Well, Coach Brown over there was talking about the fact that Dale Davis, Antoine Davis, both of their contracts are up. Rick Smith only plays about 28 minutes a game. A chance to step right in. You obviously have the size and strength for the NBA. Yeah, um, I think it's my work that if I go out and work hard every day to get better, you know, I really develop into a good player. Um, my offensive game is coming along, and uh, they have a really good team, so I'm looking forward to it. If you're coachable, you have Larry Brown as one of the best. What do you have to work on offensively? Um, I think I work on my offensive move every day, uh, just getting used to him, uh, just going up against, against good players in the NBA. Uh, it's going to make me a better player, so I'm looking forward to it. Hey, congratulations. Ernie? All right, thank you, Segs. Well, in this building, March Madness culminated with the Final Four, and in the semifinals, Kentucky took on UMass. And a couple of good friends squared off in that one, John Calipari and Rick Pitino. Kentucky won it, went on to win the national championship, and then when talk of the New Jersey coaching vacancy came up, those two good friends were front and center. Should I stay or should I go now? It was a wonderful offer by some people that I, that I call friends. But I'm very, I've just been too happy in Kentucky for seven years to look at anything else. Should I stay or should I go now? My goal is to create a love affair between this organization 
and the fans in New Jersey. And that's what we've got to do. And I also want to thank Rick for not taking this job. Should I stay or should I go? You know, if I'm Sally Jesse Raphael, I'm asking you two guys to hug right now. I mean, good friends and joining us on the set now, the new head coach of the New Jersey Nets, John Calipari. John, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. How's this night been? Well, this has been interesting. I said I, I was under some pressure when we were playing Rick. Let me tell you what, there was some pressure in that room because you don't know who's going before you. Those first, those next two picks uh, made it interesting, but we got the player we wanted. Uh, we dabbled with some other guys, but uh, that was a guy that I felt very good about and could play two positions. You know, we really want to re-sign Chris Childs, but it's a problem if we can't, and, and I worry about that, and I think this gives us some uh, uh, movement at one and two. John, were you not listening to uh, Peter Vesey when he said, Kobe Bryant is your guy? Where did Kobe <laughs> Bryant enter the equation? Well, we really like Kobe, and, and uh, I think he's going to be a terrific player, and I think he's going to be a, a terrific player in the NBA. Uh, but for us right now where we are and what we needed, I felt uh, in the end it was Kerry Kittles. And, and really, you'll read about it tomorrow in Peter's column. It, it, it's <laughs> <laughs> hey, when you look at your situation, John, and Rick both, this question to you guys. What was it that said, I'm staying at Kentucky? What said, I want to leave you? Well, I, I coached four years in the NBA, and I say this all the time, and not just because he's here. I learned more basketball in the two years with UB Brown than I've had in, in, in 30 years I've been around this game. Uh, and, and for me, that was the greatest learning experience of my life. Then to go on to be a head coach and try to go against some of the greatest coaches in the land was even more beneficial. John needed that experience. I've already been through that experience. So I think for him, it's a dream of a lifetime. He'll do a wonderful job here in New Jersey, and they're very lucky to have him. John, John, the, John, the toughest thing for you to do right now, coming cold into the NBA. I don't know who my team is. I, you know, you can't really prepare because we were going in not knowing who we were going to draft. You have to draft without knowing who you're going to re-sign or who you're going to try to sign as a free agent. We know in college or we knew who your team was going to be next year. That's the hardest thing for me, and um, I think that's what I have to go with. John Calipari, thank you very much for Thanks. joining us. Good luck in your first season. Thank you of the very NBA. much. Let's Good go, luck, John. Let's go down to the commissioner. There's a trade and a pick. Milwaukee conveys the draft rights to Stephon, Stephon Marbury to Minnesota in exchange for the draft rights to Ray Allen and a future first round draft pick. So, hey, moving right along. With the 11th pick in the 1996 NBA Draft, the Golden State Warriors select Todd Fuller from North Carolina State University. So no centers were chosen in the first nine picks of the draft, and then we go back-to-back -back centers with Eric Dampier going to Indiana and Todd Fuller going to Golden State with the 11th pick. You, got, you have to look at this and say they were very high on Fuller right from the beginning. Uh, you're dealing with a guy who was overshadowed in the ACC by Duncan and Wallace during his career. He improved every year. He averaged over 20 points this year. He's mobile enough that he can play two positions for you. Kevin Willis is a free agent at the center position. Ronnie Cycli is still under contract. But what you're getting here is a young guy who has really improved his game from year to year to year. And a quality guy, too, a GPA of close to a perfect four at NC State. And you talk about being overshadowed to a degree by Tim Duncan. He scored 30 against him as a junior. He has his moments. He has very much overlooked uh, in the evaluations of a lot of people, but he should not have been overlooked. This young man can flat out play in a great con from a great conference. And I think I think Golden State made a smart pick by getting this young man because they, they he, again, fills the need of this basketball team. Pretty good range with the jumper, too. Yeah, we see that. That's what's good, Ernie. See, he has the hook, he has the jumper facing, and then he has the turnaround moves. Now, of course, he's going to have, you know, some problems that he has to work on. Naturally, he's got to bulk up a little bit if he's going to play strictly center for them. But he, once again, now, you look at that Golden State, when that team is healthy, they have a lot of guys with talent. Yeah. Now, he may have an affinity for playing defense, too. Bobby Jones coached him in high school. Let's go back to the trade here real quick, the Marbury deal. 
your take on this thing. And, and Marbury likes Kevin Garnett. Now he goes to Minnesota. Well, it, it's it's great for Minnesota. We talked about a possible trade at that time. Uh, we also brought out the point that Milwaukee live, likes Ray Allen. They needed range. Rick brought out the point. They already have Sherman Douglas, and he has two more years on his contract. So, you know, I, I could see it happen. And, and they really love the character. Not, not that they didn't love the character of Stephon Marbury. Ray Allen really impressed them. And the other thing they, they looked at, Stephon Marbury stays three years. He's from a big city. Does he still want to stay in Milwaukee when the three years are up? And, and that has to be a factor. So we've had the ceremonial switch of hats over there and uh, uh, the trade Stephon Marbury, Marbury to uh, Minnesota for Ray Allen, who goes to Milwaukee. Todd Fuller was just picked by Golden State. State. He is standing by now with Craig Sick. All right, uh, first of all, you go from Charlotte Christian High School to NC State as a freshman. You average only five points a game. Three years later, you lead the ACC in scoring. You're number one pick. What happened? Well, I was just persistent through it over the years. I got better and better each and every year. And I stayed with my strengths, but at the same time, I continued to develop my weaknesses in my game. You're a math major. The Warriors won only 36 games last year. How do you change their team? Well, first of all, I think I can come in right away and help with the center position, you know, help with Ronnie Cycli, and also add some rebounding to that team. Um, in addition to that, I believe, depending on the matchup situation for a particular game, I can also help out a power forward as well. Sad to leave Carolina? No, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to go to California. I enjoyed my visit out there, and it was a productive visit. I look forward to the opportunity to go out to Golden State. Good luck with the Warriors. Ernie? All right, Greg Todd Fuller heads to the Bay Area. Next up, the Cleveland Cavaliers, another team in need of some size up front. Let's go to Cheryl Miller, who's covering the Central Division, and she is in Cleveland. Cheryl, so good to see you again. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ernie. But you just mentioned that the Cavs definitely need some size and definitely look for both of those two picks to go for some big man. Right now, when I spoke to... Uh, um, Mike Fratello yesterday, he was a little concerned about when the, when the pick came around for the 12th pick that some quality big men would not be there. He said if that was the case, that they would try to go with some smaller people. If that's the case, it might go with the smaller big men. Look at Potapinko or John Wallace. All right, Cheryl, thank you very much. Cheryl Miller joining us from Gund Arena in Cleveland, where Mike Fratello has about a minute and 20 seconds to go before making his pick the 12th of the first round. The Cleveland Cavaliers is an obvious need. You got to get big. Uh, you have to get big mainly because Brad Doherty just retired, and that was a major haul for this basketball team. Now, you have good people, but no major size guys. You have guys at 6'9", 6'10". Uh, they play to their maximum night in and night out. You must increase the depth of size and length. The Cleveland Cavaliers on the board, and the commissioner is ready with their pick. With the 12th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Cleveland Cavaliers select Vitaly Potapenko from Wright State University. Wright State University by way of Kiev, Ukraine. The Ukraine train, they call him. You look at him right now, Ernie, and you say he's sleek. When he was playing during the college season, he weighed 310 pounds. By the time he went to the camp in Chicago, he was down to 270. No player in the Chicago draft helped themselves more than that young man. He was one of the top scorers in the camp. He was the only center who could score with his back to the basket in every single session. Great hands, good shooting touch, and all business. And definitely we have a weight look book, book on the horizon very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Vitaly Potapenko, down to 277 pounds. Yeah, pass that book around. 6'9 and a half, 277. And this is a guy who put up some pretty good numbers. Nearly 21 points a game, seven rebounds, despite the fact he was double and triple teamed a lot. Now, what you have to like about him, Ernie, is he has excellent hands. But he has a knack of knowing where to go for, as a big man. 
When a man would leave him to double team in Chicago, he always found the hole. And then when he was hit with the pass, he can finish. There is no doubt this guy can play facing the basket with his back to the basket. He really has a high IQ. So even if you are double or triple teaming him, you can't double or triple team a train, you get run over. And uh, he is uh, he's the next pick, Vitaly Potapenko, by the Cleveland Cavaliers of Mike Fratello. And here's Greg Sager. Well, the Ukraine train has been logging more miles than Amway, I think, in Amtrak. You told me you went, what, 12 different visits. You're happy to go to Cleveland, though. It was about 11 different teams, 11 different cities, five on West Coast and six on West Coast and six and five on East side, you know. And um, I enjoyed all the visits. I met different people, different coaching staff, but it was enjoyable. What about Mike Fratello and the Cavs? Oh, I, I enjoy work with him, and I have good workout in, uh, at uh, Cleveland Cavaliers. And I'm looking forward. I was looking forward, and I'm right now I'm very excited to play for him and play with great players like Terrell Brandon and uh, young players, Bob Shura, and they have other very good players. We mentioned the off-season conditioning. You lost 25 pounds. Why? Uh, because, you know, it's, I had to lose weight. I was thinking, you know, to build up more muscle mass. You know, I was lifting a lot. But uh, since I lost weight, I feel much better on my feet. I'm uh, moving quicker, and it's helped me a lot. Certainly has. Congratulations. Vitaly Potapenko. Let's go back to Ernie. All right, six. Vitaly Potapenko of Ukraine teaming up with the Tsar in Cleveland. Up next, the Charlotte Hornets. Back at you in a minute. moves and when when you you look at him you're talking about a young man with range he can go off the dribble he can get his shot and in every place that he worked out nothing but raves no one talking about any shortness or a weakness in his game Jerry West told me today that greatness lies ahead for this young man. Thought he was going to be absolutely fantastic. I recruited him out of high school, and certainly I believe everything he said in, in this man's ability. He is just flat out going to be outstanding. It's going to take him a little time, though, because he, he's going from high school, skipping college, into a very physical game. All he did was average 31 points a game his senior year. His team won the state title with 31 wins and three losses, and he eclipsed the uh, scoring mark of Will Chamberlain in Pennsylvania. This kid has got it all. Yeah, you get the package, and I think what you like best about him, everyone says that he makes everyone else around him a better player. And he, he's a, a winning style guy. Uh, we, we realize that there's a lot to overcome when you come right out of high school. But if, if anyone has a good chance, this young man is blessed with outstanding offensive skills. His dad, Joe Jellybean Bryant, was the 14th pick when he was selected. Kobe, number 13. Let's go to Craig Sager. Well, Kobe, your dad can tell you about the NBA. You can watch every playoff game on TV. But until you go through the workouts, experience yourself, you don't get that firsthand. What was it like, the tryouts? What did you learn? Well, I learned that you have to work hard and you have to approach the game with a serious mindset. Uh, there's a step up from high school, and I understand that. So, therefore, every time I step on a basketball court, I'm going to put a strong effort out there on the floor. I'm, I'm not going to leave anything on the floor. You had the grades. You had the scores to go to college. Why the NBA? It's the ultimate challenge. You know, if I was 40 years old and I'm sitting back and I'm looking back at my career, if I went to college and played on the NBA, maybe I had a great career, maybe not, and I'm still having that doubt in my mind, could I have answered that challenge? Could I have responded to the challenge of the NBA? And that's something that I didn't want to have on my, on my shoulders, so I just really accepted it. A year ago is Kevin Garnett sitting where you are. Have you talked to him? What advice has he given you? Well, he's talked to me. He's told me a lot of stories and a lot of experiences that he was going through. But all in all, he said it has to be your own decision. You know, he said that I, he can give me a lot of pros and cons, but ultimately it has to be my decision. Well, here's a copy of The Sting, the official book of the Charlotte Hornets with your new coach, Dave Cowens, on the cover. Do your homework before you show up at the Hive. Thank you very much. I, I, I'll make sure I will. All right, congratulations, <laughs> Ernie. Wow, Sig's always coming prepared to the NBA draft. Now, you know Joe Jellybean Bryan, we talked about being picked 14th. He's an eight-year NBA veteran and a firm believer in the abilities of his son. I think he's rare. A rare breed. There's only been a few players that actually make players around them better. I mean, you look at uh, Magic Johnson and you look at Larry Bird. Uh, even when Michael Jordan came in the league, he really didn't make the people around him better. I mean, he was a superstar player, but, you know, I think it takes a certain air to make people around you better, and I think Kobe has that, that quality. 
Kobe Bryant, the high school kid, chosen in the first round, number 13, by the Charlotte Hornets. Let's go down to Peter Vesey. Pete, what's up? Well, every year somebody drops in this draft. A couple years ago, Wesley Person. Last year, Michael Finley. This year, it's John Wallace. We all praised him for going back to school, and he did everything he was supposed to do. He took Syracuse to the final two. He worked on his game. He's fiercely competitive. For whatever reason, he's dropped. Maybe the Suns are supposed to get him as he drops, but maybe the Kings will take him at this slot. Certainly the story of John Wall is an intriguing one, and I think a lot of people wondering exactly how far he would drop. Let's go down to the commissioner who's got the 14th pick of the Sacramento Kings. With the 14th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Sacramento Kings select Predrag Stojakovic from Pau in Greece. If he looks young, he is. He's 19 years old, just turned 19, and playing some ball in Greece. Give me your thoughts on the talents of Fred Rock Stojakovic. Well, it's interesting because in Chicago, when he came in to work out, uh, there are not, a lot of people like his talent. They feel he's a small forward at that size. He's an offensive player. He played in Yugoslavia before he became a citizen in Greece. He has played there. And guys, you have, you have to look at Sacramento this way. Billy Owens has an injury which they have to cover themselves for. Uh, Lionel Simmons is still at that small forward position also. Kevin Gamble is a free agent. So that's what they're doing right here. But it is interesting that they would go with this pick over John Wallace. I'm a little surprised at that. But you know, you can't take away. John Wallace was going to be the 17th, 18th pick uh, last year. He'll probably be a little bit early and he still has the memories of a final four. So it hopefully all work out for John Wallace. This guy also, Stojakovic, coming back from a broken leg, QB, uh, in August of 1995 and missed three months, came back his first game and scored 24. I guess no ill effects from that. Now, the thing, see, Sacramento has liked him from the get-go. Sacramento, they were looking at Kobe Bryant. They were looking for Wright. And then he was going to be their third pick. And as the people go off the board, they were sold on this guy right from the get-go. The other thing we have to understand with when you look at this type of Greece now has taken over for Italy and Spain as the number one place to play professional basketball. The only other weakness I guess we could see there is, is the way he wore the hat. Maybe Dale Earnhardt <laughs> needs to get a hold of that thing. Frank Sager's down there. Well, first of all, you played with Red Star of Belgrade. You played with Palk of Greece. Now a chance to go with the Kings of the NBA. How do you compare the leagues? Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy that I'm still I'm here. This was my dream to play in NBA and I'm so glad to have played against top-level competition here in the NBA. What about the dream of playing in the NBA? When did you first say, hey, I want to go to America? I did a good season in my team in Park in Greece, and I decided to go in the NBA this year. You like Sacramento? Yeah, I like. I'm, I'm very happy to choose the Sacramento Kings. It's a great team. All right, congratulations. Good luck. Back to the set. Fred Rukstoyakovic. The 14th pick in the first round taken by the Sacramento Kings. Who's up next? The Phoenix Suns with a 15 pick. We'll be right back at you after this. The waiting game continues for John Wallace of Syracuse, who is admired for his decision to go back to school. Thought it would improve his standing in the draft. He remains seated in the green room waiting to be chosen here in the NBA draft. We are through 14 picks. Let's go down to the podium and the Phoenix Suns pick with the commissioner David Stern. With the 15th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Phoenix Suns select Steve Nash from the University of Santa Clara. Steve Nash, the first Bronco to go in the first round since when, you ask? 1969, but Ogden to Philadelphia. You remember that, Hubie? I sure do. <laughs> As a matter of fact, one of my dearest friends, Carl Williams, was an assistant coach back then uh, and then became the head coach, now the athletic director. I know the Broncos are very happy. Uh, this young man, they recruited him from Victoria, Canada. He plays on a Canadian national team. Uh, just an outstanding young man. Now you say, why Phoenix? 
Well, Phoenix must protect themselves. Kevin Johnson has already given the news that he's going to retire after one more year. Uh, they also are have involved before this draft in some potential trades using Elliot Perry uh, as a throw-in with a certain guy by the initial CB. Now, who knows whether uh, that is going to happen. So what you're seeing here is Phoenix protecting themselves. This is an organization that did a magnificent job over the last two years getting Person and Finley, and people kind of forget Chris Carr, Mario Bennett, and Coker. And they're doing this organization over, and this is a good start at the point guard position. Kevin Johnson has been a little injury prone. As you said, you may trade, you may trade Perry. This is a young man that can grow with Finley and become a, and form a good nucleus to this Phoenix Sun basketball team. Rick Majerus, the head coach at Utah, calls him the poor man's John Stockton. And he's got some definite skills, in fact, among the skills, not just dishing the ball off. The guy's a tremendous free throw shooter, nearly 90%. And at the Desert Classic, his coach there was KC Jones, called him a natural leader. Well, he, he has excellent vision, Ernie. He sees the floor. He can make the play. And then he has three-point range. Steve Nash going to the Phoenix Suns, and we go to Craig. Uh, you know, Steve, normally, I know you're happy. Normally, we don't like to compare players to those currently in the NBA. But with you, the comparisons don't stop. I must ask for the comparison between you and Kurt Rambus, the other set of clear pro. <laughs> well, uh, we're similar in size, I think. Uh, no. uh, you know, honest, honestly, it's just exciting for me to, to be here. I think that uh, Santa Clara hasn't had a pro since Rambus, and it's exciting for the school. And I want to thank Santa Clara, St. Michael's High School, Arbutus Junior High, all my coaches, my family, and my friends. They've done a lot for me along the way, and I couldn't have done it without any of them. Marty Blake, the NBA's director of scouting, always talks about the importance of playing in these postseason camps. What was your mentality? What were your thoughts going into Phoenix and the Desert Classic when you performed so well? Uh, well, there's a lot of pressure there because you never know where you're going to go, and I think people are always speculating this and that. And, uh, you know, I just went out there with a positive attitude and try to control things that I could control and not worry about the extracurricular stuff. So I was really uh, pleased with my performance in Phoenix, and it definitely helped me. Congratulations. Cotton picked his man. Let's go back to the set. All right, thank you, Seg. Steve Nash goes to the Phoenix Suns. You know, he's from Victoria, British Columbia. For a time, was known as Victoria's Secret. A secret no longer as he's taken in the first round by the Phoenix Suns. Let us check in now with Scott Hastings, our Pacific Division correspondent, standing by with... She's like, I used to work with us, Danny Oh, Ainge. my gosh. <laughs> hey, I, never, I never got to wear the makeup like he gets the makeup. Oh. I, I bought it from his wife. Hey, the good thing you guys got a new hockey team down here, so you get a Canadian down here so we can watch hockey. Well, Steve is a big hockey fan from Canada, so we got the Coyotes down here now. He's looking forward to that. Now, now what the, the sign on Steve Nash, a lot of people say John Wallace is around there. Do you need some depth in, in your big man position? But as, as uh, Hubie just mentioned, Kevin Johnson may retire in a year. Well, we got a lot of frontline players, Scott, and uh, this was a draft out of need. We have uh, Kevin Johnson retiring after a year, and we don't have a first-round pick next year. We also think Steve's a terrific player. We, re we really like the way he enters the ball in the post. We like the way he runs the floor. We like the way he can shoot, and uh, we're very excited to have him. Now, what we got here, you played against Charles Barkley. You're now going to coach Charles Barkley. What are you going to do with Charles Barkley? Uh, Charles is going to do whatever he wants to do, just like he always has. I'm not going to make any difference there. The Phoenix Sun draft, Steve Nash. Forget Stockton. How about the new Danny Ainge in the NBA? Okay. Hey, hey, while well, you got Danny there for a second, and Danny, I mean, what's the definitive word on Charlie getting traded? I don't know. There's a lot, been a lot of discussions, Ernie, lately, but nothing is imminent right now. It, it could go on forever, and we could have Charles back, which would be great. Danny, thank you for joining us. Scotty, we'll talk right. to you in a few minutes. The right. Phoenix Suns taking Steve Nash in the first round with a 15th pick. The number 16 pick belongs to the Charlotte Hornets, who were just up a couple of picks ago at number 13 when they took Kobe Bryant. Let's go to the commissioner for Charlotte's next pick. With the 16th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Charlotte Hornets select Tony Delk from the University of Kentucky. Tony is not here. 
Tony Dell going to the Charlotte Hornets. He had visited the Hornets a couple of times, and they obviously were pleased with what they saw, Rick. And, and he wasn't invited, just to clear that yeah. up. Uh, <laughs> Tony Dell wanted to go to the Charlotte Hornets. That was the team he was hoping he would be drafted by. And speaking with Dave Cowens, he wanted someone who could apply defensive pressure at the point position, as well as score from the perimeter. Dave feels, obviously, a Charlotte's weaknesses is stopping people, and he feels Tony can be an impetus to help that basketball team defend. Well, what I like about it, Rick, you know, as an outsider, uh, this guy can finish. He's a big-time shooter with the shot clock going down, and I, I know that when the game was on the line, you loved it when he had the ball in his hands. Yes, and, and it fits the NBA game. You be the clock's running down, you have to get your shot off. Here's a young man who gets his own shot, but also turns around and can pick you up at half court, and you're not losing him. You have to remember now, Charlotte, Kenny Anderson, questionable, free agent, Tyrone Bogues, the knee, he could not come back and give them any major minutes in the, in the second half of the season last year, so his future is questionable. Question on Tony Dell, can he play point? I think so in the NBA, the same way Mookie Blaylock. He reminds me a little bit of Mookie Blaylock. You know, remember, you have a 24-second clock. You don't have that many options to run. You've got to run a pick and roll. You've got to get the ball inside. Tony Dell can certainly bring the ball up versus pressure and play that position. And I, I think Kenny Anderson will not be signed now by the Charlotte Hornets. He was the MVP of the Final Four right here in this building as Kentucky won the national championship. Hit seven threes in the clinching game to Tony Dell. Let's check in now with Peter Vesey, Pete. The Knicks are in great position here. They're salivating. They've got three out of the next five number one picks. They want Jermaine O'Neal. Portland wants him also. But somebody's going to drop to them, whether it's John Wallace, McCarty, or Brian Evans. They're going to get three of the four players that they wanted. All right, thank you very much, Peter. We are down to the number 17 pick belonging to the Portland Trailblazers. In comes that big stretch of New York picks. Back to tell you what transpires here in the first round of the draft when we come back. Back to the 1996 NBA draft from Continental Airlines Arena in New Jersey. That is the green room where the players and their families have been waiting. The, uh, the numbers dwindling somewhat as we are now down to the 17th pick of the first round. There's the commission. With the 17th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Portland Trailblazers select Jermaine O'Neal from Eau Claire High School in South Carolina. Jermaine is not here. Popular pick. Yes, indeed. Uh, that, that's one of the, the biggest salvations of the I evening. Know, it's incredible. I didn't know PJ had that many relatives in this building. <laughs> you would have thought that maybe the Knicks had grabbed him the way they reacted here, but the Knicks came this close, but don't get him. How much of a project is Jermaine O'Neal? How long do you have to wait? I recruited him from sophomore year on, and I honestly thought we were going to get him at the University of Kentucky. He does not have the body to play in the NBA, but he definitely has the potential to be a big-time shot blocker, rebounder. He runs well. He's got to refine his low post game, but certainly this is a pick for the future. Now you now have two high school kids drafted in the top 20, two young men. Well, you know, going in, Ernie, they, they were talking about uh, Jermaine O'Neal, John Wallace, and McCarty. So they did get one of the three guys that they were looking for. John Wallace, as we see, still sitting. How can this be happening? I mean, we talked about him slipping. What did you think this far? Yeah, well, it, it has to do with the workouts that he went through. Uh, the uh, conversations with the coaching staffs, the battery of tests that they give you, and then also, is he a power forward or is he a small forward? He played the back of the 2-3 zone. Can he make the adjustment to small forward? Now, a lot of these guys might step back off of that. I, I now realize why they cheered so loudly for Jermaine O'Neal, because they want Wallace to go to New York. Yeah. <laughs> Could be the fact. 18, 19, and 21 belong to the Knicks. Let's go down to Peter Vesey. I don't think there's any doubt about it. They're going to get Wallace. And for whatever reason, I know he interviewed poorly at a few places. Some people think he's another Derek Coleman. You've got to treat everybody differently. This guy is a hard worker, and I think the Knicks are going to make themselves a great pick. Let's not forget they got Mark Jackson at number 18 once upon a time. They do well at number 18. All right, Peter, let's go back now and talk about Jermaine O'Neal for one more second as he is picked by the Portland Trail Blazers at 6'11 and... 216, the player of the year in South Carolina, and Hubie, 
Your thoughts on Jermaine O'Neal. No, I, I think it's a very good pick for them. Uh, you know, you have Sabonis in the middle with Portland. You still have Buck Williams. You still have Cliff Robinson. You know, you have a cast of guys out there, plus Harvey Grant. You have an awful lot of people up front. So you can gamble on a talent like this and just say, you know what? We don't need to, him to play here for the next couple of years. And definitely it changes my summer recruiting plans now that two <laughs> high school kids have been drafted in the top 20. He played in a hoop summit game against international players under 22 years of age and scored 21 points, 10 rebounds, and had seven blocks in a game. So Jermaine O'Neal certainly has the tools and he is on his way to the Portland Trailblazers. This place is rocking right now because the New York Knicks have three of the next four picks coming up. And well, again, John yeah. Wallace enters into the equation. Where else do they go? Ernie, I, I think you have to remember that. that they wanted Wallace, McCarty, Dante Jones, and then also any one of the three big European players. So the Knicks are, could not have picked this any better than the way it's falling into their lap. And obviously the Syracuse contingent is here wanting Wallace to go to the New York Knickerbockers. And if the Knicks get John Wallace, they get a four-year player. And it was not bad that John sat out the extra year because he enhanced his game. Right around the same draft pick, the Knicks are very lucky if they pick up John Wallace here, or Walter McCarty or Dante Jones for that matter. The New York Knicks holding all the cards right now with three of the next four picks. And when you look at this team, there are also questions. I guess Jeff Van Gundy is your new man, but uh, the small forwards who are remaining out there, and you see Wallace and Jerome Williams of Georgetown is a pretty good ball player. And boy, they are chanting here, and they want to hear who the Knicks pick is. And Commissioner David Stern about to make his way to the podium. There's a big John Wallace fan ready to hear the name called if indeed it is here comes the commish with the 19th pick in the 1996 NBA draft the New York Knicks select John Wallace from Syracuse University A native of Rochester, New York, the 18th pick in the first round of the 1996 NBA draft. Sounds like Kentucky just won the national championship in here, doesn't it? The place is rocking as John Wallace of the Orange goes to the Knicks. Well, it was well worth the wait for this young man because he got the only bad thing about this is on one side he's got to get hit by Anthony Mason, yeah. on the other side he's got to get hit by Charles Oakley. <laughs> Outside of that, the New York Knicks and Jeff Van Gundy are very lucky. They are because they, they need to rebuild their front line on their second unit. Because if you come with Mason, Ewing, and Oakley, you need to have the depth factor. It definitely hurt them in the playoffs. They did not get enough scoring up front with the substitutes. Let's enjoy this moment as he makes his appearance before the fans here in New Jersey. The New York Knicks first first round pick. There's his mom, Vanessa. Saw Cheryl Miller's report last night in our draft preview about what Vanessa has meant to that family. What a great night this is for John Wallace and his family as he's selected by the New York Knicks. Had to wait a while, had to sweat a little bit, but the Knicks have him with the 18th pick of the first round. Hubie? Well, the main thing here is, is you're getting a guy that can score facing the basket, and any time that you have a Patrick Ewing who's posting up as much as he, as he does, and then the fact that you run Mason inside on quite a bit, you need people who can play frontline positions, who can make the jump shot facing the basket, and I think that's one of his key areas. You know, you improve at a rapid pace in the NBA when you go against daily competition. And this young man's going to get great competition, great coaching. And this was wonderful for John Wallace as well as wonderful for the New York Knicks to get a player at this caliber this late. Much was made of the fact that John Wallace returned to school for his senior year, despite the fact he was thinking about coming out last year. And the one guy who thought that was the right move certainly was the Detroit Pistons' Grand Hill. 
John Wallace definitely so, showed me a lot. I think showed the entire public uh, what he could do. I think uh, he's definitely extended his range to a three-point shot. He can post up, uh, and he's versatile. He can put the ball on the floor. Uh, at 6'9", he could be a very good uh, three-man in the NBA. Well, first of all, we said you could go anywhere in the top 15. You dropped to 18, but I haven't seen the Nick fans this happy since the foul was called on Scotty Pippen against Hubert Davis. <laughs> Congratulations. How do you feel about being with the Knicks? I, just, I feel real good right now. The uh, bottom line that I'm in the NBA and I'm, I'm staying in, you know, I'm, home's been New York and it's going to remain to be New York for the next couple of years, and I'm happy about that. You receive a lot of advice from your family. I know it was a big decision. We went back to school. What has your family told you, particularly your mother sitting back there waiting? My mother just told me to keep my head up. She knows the type of player I'm being. I'm, I'm emerging one of the top players from this draft. It doesn't matter where I got picked. But we know you can rebound. You can block shots. Some people question the defense because in college you always played the zone. How do you feel you fit in with the Knicks? I'm going to fit in well. Um, all the players up there, Mason, Ewing, you, you know, and um, Harper and all them, and Coach Van Gundy. And I'm just looking forward to um, getting up there. Lifelong Nick fan stays in New York. Congratulations. Let's go back to Ernie. Thanks, Eggs, and one of the many college players who chuckles when the term defense is brought up. But John Wall is going to the Knicks, and they're still up. Back to tell you who they take at 19 after this. Good reason. And, and now you know why we won the national championship. <laughs> uh, Walter McCarty is a 10-star person on a 5-star scale. The New York Knicks at 18 and 19 are doing magnificent. I don't just say that because I've coached this young man. He's a legit 6'10". He gives them what they need from the perimeter. He can knock down the three-point shot, the mid-range shot, his low post game. I, I always used to say when he got hit and went to the ground, I said, look, God forbid someday you get hit by Ewing, Mason, or Oakley. He's now going to find out. He'll never forgive me for making that statement. <laughs> To the rousing cheers of some New York Knicks fans, Walter McCarty makes his entrance to the stage. This, this young man does a mile in 446. He was a state champion at the 440. He's a great sprinter. He has great hops, wins every slam dunk contest, plays the piano, and can do Stevie Wonder impersonations better than Stevie Wonder. So he's a, he's a well-rounded young man. Now the Knicks came out of this uh, with a windfall, and they still have another pick. Uh, when you look at it, you got the three-point shooting, Rick, and that's the big thing. But what I like about him also is he can score with his back to the basket. When you say they've added McCarty and Wallace, two players with size, two players who can score in an area that they needed to improve. And both of us felt that McCarty and Wallace could be projected late lottery picks. And now the Knicks get them both at 18 and 19. Both have a very strong work ethic. I think the Knicks are doing great. Walter McCarty standing by now with Craig Sagan. Let's go down to Craig. Well, at Harrison High School in Evansville, obviously you're a front court player. You're a track star. How did going to Kentucky and their style of play help you in the adaptation to the NBA? I think it really helped me out with the, um, the system Coach P runs. He runs the NBA system. And um, everything that we do at Kentucky, we, um, they do in the pros. And that really helped us out a lot. The three guys taking the draft from Kentucky. So um, really prepared us well. The Knicks receive a tremendous forward. However, it sounds like the marketing department has received somebody to play the national anthem or, or sings at the uh, Garden. What song possibly describes how you feel right now? Because even though time's got rough and you never turned away, you were right there, and I thank you. Walter McCarty, <laughs> obviously right at home inside the Garden or outside on Broadway. Congratulations. Good luck in New York. <laughs> Wow, undiscovered talent. Very nice from Walter McCarty. You know the last time the Knicks picked somebody from Kentucky? I bet you do, Hubie. Can uh, Skywalker ring a bell? Yeah, listen, and before his back injury, he averaged over 16 a game, you know, in his rookie season. How about an inside look now at Walter McCarty and, and your impressions of what he will bring the New York Knicks? Yeah, I, I, I just like the size factor and that he can score. And you're going to see it right here. See, he's an excellent post-up player. He has the spin moves, can shoot up over the top of people. And that is a key in the NBA. Then, any time that he trails on the break, you always have the threat of the three-point shot. 
could not be going to a better team. If you think about it, when you post Ewing, you take Mason and Oakley out of the game, and you have Wallace and McCarty, and you have two guys who can hit the outside shots. It takes an awful lot of pressure off of Patrick Ewing. So the New York Knicks making some hay here at the 18 and 19 spots in the first round. And let's check in again with our Atlantic Division correspondent now, Kevin Kiley in Philadelphia. K squared, take it, kid. Thank you so much, Ernie. Now, as the Knicks rebuild their front court with the draft, don't forget that going into the draft, they're $9 million under the cap, and they would like to pick up one or two free agents. When you look in the backcourt, Reggie Miller it looms large, but Reggie is expected to go back to Indiana. They were talking about taking Juwan Howard from Washington, but they've rebuilt the front court in Detroit. They are very, very nervous that the Knicks are going to make a run at Allen Houston. Alan Houston, the great shooting guard from Detroit. So keep your eye on that in the days to come. Back to you, Ernie. All right, thank you very much, Kevin. We're up to the 20th pick in the first round. It belongs to the Cleveland Cavaliers. It is their second pick of the first round. Earlier, at number 12, they took Vitaly Potopinko of Wright State. Where do you go now? We go to the commissioner, David <laughs> Stern. He's got the answer. <laughs> With the 20th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Cleveland Cavaliers select Zydrunas Ilgowskis from Lithuania. Well, with those two picks, the Cleveland Cavaliers definitely lead the league in first-round syllables. Zydrunas Ilgowskis of Lithuania, Vitaly Potapenko was already taken with the 12th pick in the first round as Cleveland tries to get bigger, and they're doing exactly that, you uh, and, 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 you know, and it's good because they're big, they're strong, they're young. This guy can score. Uh, he's been out with an injury for a couple of seasons, but he came back. He helped his team win the Lithuanian championship uh, for the third straight season. He'll be on their Olympic team, so you know that he's going to get a great experience over the summer. And... They needed it in Cleveland, and they, once again, they got lucky. Rick, I know you know this guy because when he was touring with the Lithuanian team, he played Kentucky. He played against Kentucky. He's an outstanding basketball player, and that was a few years ago, so you know he's improved. And and thankfully, Michael Fratello speaks well with his hands because his <laughs> communication skills are going to have to be up to par with, with the two guys they drafted. But here is a young man that, that has great skills. He can do a number of different things, and I think, again, it fills, every team is filling their needs, and that's what's great to see. Normally you hear, well, they took the best athlete. So far, every team is filling the voids that, the, that they have on their ball club. And just to refresh your memory, 26 points and 19 rebounds and four blocks in that tour in 94 against Kentucky. Just thought you'd like to Thanks, know. You probably already have that in the memory. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back down to Craig. <laughs> Well, a year ago, we talked about the chance of you playing in the NBA. Obviously, growing up in Lithuania, has it always been a dream? What does it feel like to say, hey, I'm in the NBA? Yeah, thanks, God. I'm very excited. I'm waiting for so many years, working hard, and finally I'm in the league. I can't tell in the words. It's so exciting. I couldn't believe it. Obviously, Mike Fratello does a good job scouting over the world. We know what he's going to tell you but the rest of the world can see you this summer the Lithuanian national team playing in the Olympics what kind of team do you have can you beat the dream team I don't think so <laughs> we're gonna have pretty good team but I think we can be in the first three plays so maybe a medal congratulations good luck in Cleveland back to the set <laughs> All right, Segs, Adrina Zilgowskis going to the Cleveland Cavaliers of Mike Fratello. The New York Knicks are back up again. Don't go away. And we welcome you back to the 1996 NBA Draft. 20 players have been selected. Five centers, five power forwards leading the way at this point. The top pick overall was Allen Iverson, the Georgetown sophomore who was taken number one by the Philadelphia 76ers. The New York Knicks with three picks in the first round. At 18, they took John Wallace, who had to wait a while, but it was worth it. And then at number 19, they took Walter McCarty of the Kentucky Wildcats. That's the situation at the New York Point. Mark Jackson, Rod Strickland, Greg Anthony, Charlie Ward. You see them. And uh, right now you have, you have the situation with Derek Harper there. What's, this, what's the situation with Derek? No, well, I, I, who knows? I mean, it isn't like they do not like his style of play. Uh, what they're looking at is his age. 
Now, will they keep him? Derek had an excellent season this year. Uh, is Charlie Ward ready to take over a playoff team and push them into competition for the Eastern Conference Championship? I've got to look at McGinnis at this pick. Uh, I, I think that's a solid pick for the New York Knicks. If they don't go with McGinnis, they might go with Mucci Norris. But I, I believe that McGinnis has the size they want at the point position, and I think they go with him. Now, obviously, I don't know anything about this pick, but, I, but that's who I'd pick. Iverson, Marbury, and Nash have, have gone as point guards so far. Mucci Norris, Derek Fisher. There you see McGinnis from North Carolina. Randy Livingston, a guy you, you like, see what you saw in camps? Yeah, but, but you see, going in, the Knicks were hoping to get Ilgowskis at that spot. Okay, now, will they stay big or will they go for a point guard? In the Knicks situation, put yourself in Jeff Van Gundy's shoes right now. It went from a situation where everybody said he's got no chance to stay to earning that job by leading the Knicks in a tough series against Chicago. What lies ahead for Jeff Van Gundy? Well, this listen, year? the players love his methodical approach, his organization, the way he handles the players, and all of the key guys love him as a coach. Uh, I don't think he has anything to worry about, and I like how he's really uh, helped himself here. Uh, they were also looking for a Glauskas and also Don. Dante Jones. The pick belongs to the Knicks, and we go to the commissioner. With the 21st pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the New York Knicks select Dante Jones from Mississippi State University. Another early entry candidate from Mississippi State. Dante Jones going to the New York Knicks. Their third pick of the first round. And Dante Jones, Rick, you know him pretty well. This guy really came on in the SEC tournament yes. and the NCAA. One of our losses we can take to Dante Jones. But th this pick I don't understand. Not Dante Jones. They, they got another great talent. This is a little bit duplication now. One of the players, I believe, possibly could be moved on and traded. I, I think there's too much at the three, three position right now. You have three players that can play to three. McCarty can swing possibly to the four spot. So I don't know him. Maybe a trade is, is brewing and it's in the work. He's the fifth player from the SEC taken. Is there a question about his health? Because uh, is, doesn't he have a screw in one of his feet and they yeah. think that thing may be coming loose? Now this guy, he can post up, he can face, he can hit the threes. You know, junior college player of the year just two years ago. And the big thing here is, Ernie, he has a stress fracture and they've got to straighten out the screw which is in uh, the uh, toe. 21 players picked, 15 underclassmen. Dante Jones, the latest of those from Mississippi State. Let's go back to Peter Vesey, Pete. Well, the question now is uh, we got the Grizzlies coming up next. I think they're going to go for Roy Rogers. Uh, they're definitely going big on this one. And the next one, we got the Nuggets. They're either going to go for Jeff McInnes or Eftimus Ritzius. Because if uh, Matumbo doesn't come back, they've got to protect themselves at center. That's it. Hey, how about the New York Knicks, though? We have some speculation here about what might be happening if a deal might be in the works with one of those picks. What do you think, Peter? Well, I, I think that they've been talking about trading a couple of these guys uh, going into this. There was, there was some uh, rumors earlier today that they were going to trade a couple of these guys or a couple of these picks for Cedric Sabalos. That turned out not to be correct. But I agree with Rick. I think uh, the Knicks are definitely looking at the wheel and deal here. All right, Peter Vesey joining us tonight for the 1996 NBA draft. We already have seen a trade tonight, number four and number five. Stephon Marbury, who was taken by Milwaukee, traded to Minnesota for Ray Allen as they swap the four and the five picks. We'll see if the Knicks have something in mind. Right now, the Vancouver Grizzlies are on the table with two minutes and 57 seconds to go to make their next first-round selection. They took Sharif Abdul-Rahim the first time around. Now where do you go with the Grizz? Well, they need help up front. Uh, they liked Evans from Indiana. Uh, you also know that you have Roy Rogers, a shot blocker who uh, was in Rick's conference. Uh, they can handle any kind of upfront help. Now, also, I, I like what Rick mentioned a little while ago, and that is Jeff McGinnis. This guy has some talent at six foot four. No question about it. You have the size made for that position in the NBA, and uh, he'd be a natural for them, and, and, and they could go that way. Or Rogers is an excellent shot blocker, and they're not easy to come by in the NBA. At the same time, if you go to the point, you get back to the Greg Anthony question with these guys. Yeah, but, you know, who's to say that every guy that's picked here is going to come in and, and start? I'm saying it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought 
thought maybe you were getting a little piece of the action. What do you think, Rick, right? Also here, now remember, they still can go with Retzius, okay, which would be a good choice for them. You also have Lauderdale. You have all kinds of big guys that they could possibly go. So it isn't like they're, they could be hurting. And, you know, there's another guy who played well, I thought, in Chicago, and that was Harrington out of Georgetown. Also, I thought he really helped himself. Yes, he'd be an excellent pick as well. I, I would go, though, with Rodgers. I think he's got great upside. I've seen him make more improvement in one year than any player I've seen in the last eight or nine years. If they went with Roy Rogers out of Alabama, it certainly would not be a first for the SEC in this first round. The SEC showing the way. Three Kentucky Wildcats among the five who have been selected from the SEC. The Big East with four, including the top pick in the draft, Allen Iverson of Georgetown. The ACC with a couple, and you see the rest of the list there as we count the clock down to about a minute left for the Vancouver Grizzlies and their first pick here. Surprised that we haven't seen some people go at this point. We had to wait for John Wallace. Who are you surprised to see has not gone yet, if anybody? Well, uh, Retz is, because I think that everyone felt, you know, he's a, a young player with great talent. He led the Greece national team to the junior championships. So, he has come down. Now, there's also a little question mark about his contract. I mean, that that's the only guy to me that I... Uh, that I... Well, also, I, I think somebody's going to get themselves a great basketball player in this young man, Williams, from Georgetown. Jerome I mean, Williams. Jerome Williams. He's still available, and, and he doesn't necessarily have the offensive tools, but you're going to get someone that's really going to help your ball club. Speaking as coaches, as NBA coaches, when a kid comes in, what's the first thing you got to teach him? Uh, to college. play under duress. See, uh, over here you have high school basketball and college basketball, and over here you have a game played at the top of the box, which is at 11 feet. Let us go back to the podium. Let's go to the next pick in the draft belonging to the Grizz, and here's Commissioner David Stern. With the 22nd pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Vancouver Grizzlies select Roy Rogers from the University of Alabama. I'm like you, Rick. I, I like this pick because they needed help at small forward and big forward. They needed guys who could rebound and shot block. They just got two of them in Raheem and now in Rodgers. And when you think that this guy in one game blocked 14 shots, I don't care who <laughs> he's playing against, he got 14 blocks. You, be, you, you turn around and you teach every good offensive low post player before he makes a move, locate the defense. When you play against this guy, you locate Roy Rodgers. All you try to do is get him away from you. He's that good a shot blocker. Well, how do you feel about the fact that they question his knees? Well, I, I never noticed the problem, and, when, and if you look at Alabama's program, they all show better when they get to the NBA level. And here's a young man that I think from a shot blocking standpoint, from an offensive skill standpoint, he's made great improvements in one year. He's now shooting the 15-foot face-up jump shot. He has pretty good turnaround jump shots in the low post. And also for you basketball purists who say, whatever happened to the hook shot, this guy, Roy Rogers, will shoot it. Well, I think what you also have to like, this, this guy is a, a really a, a, a very solid young man. He has a degree in marketing. He's also working right now on his master's in finance. So we know that, yeah, sure, he has, he's got the shot blocking ability, athletic talent, but he also has a fine head on his shoulders. 156 blocks as a senior. Those 14 came against the University of Georgia and broke the mark that Shaquille O'Neal had held of 12 in one game. And a long line of Alabama big men, Hubie and Rick, who can play this game and have made their way into the NBA. Isn't it interesting how very few of these Alabama guys are at the top of the list at the beginning of the year, but when we get to draft time, everyone is interested in these guys. And then they show welcome in yes, the eight time. Do. And this young man has great upside. He's, he's got a much improved offensive game, as you can see from that turnaround Jump shot. So Vancouver pulls the trigger on Roy Rogers. Here's Craig Sick. Well, as they mentioned on the set, it's roll tide once again. You sat there watching TV last year. Antonio McDice, Jason Caffey going to the first round. Now it's your turn. When did you think you'd be sitting here? Well, to be honest, Craig, I never thought I'd have this opportunity. You know, my dream was to go to college and just get my degree. I fulfilled that dream last year by graduating with a degree in marketing. 
So I uh, I worked hard, ex extremely hard in the weight room, Coach Terry Jones. I carried it over onto the court. You know, David Hobbs done a great job with me this season. You know, I just have to say congrats. Just, just thank you to all my people back at the University of Alabama for working so hard with me, all the fans for their support. You know, it, it, was, it was tremendously hard on me waiting back in the green room, but I'm just glad to be selected here in the draft. Well, Rick Pitino said he hasn't seen a player grow as much in one year as you have probably in the last decade. I know Roy Sr., Nadine are very proud parents. You're an NBA draft pick. You have two degrees. The question they always ask at graduation, where do you hope to be five to ten years from now? Five to ten years from now, Craig, I hopefully I will be in the front office of an NBA team. <laughs> I hope, you know, if my career is over in 12 years, I want to be around the game. I don't want to coach because coaching has too short of a lifespan, so hopefully I can be in the front <laughs> office making the decisions about who I'm going to hire and fire. Oh, you're right, Hubie. This guy's got his act together. Let's go back to the set. He does have his act together. Let's take an inside look at Roy Rogers, Hubie, and what you like about his game. Yeah, I think Rick brought out a great point, and that is that every team that played against Alabama, you are constantly worrying, where is this guy from the defensive standpoint? And you're going to see now here, you think you got a shot. He can come down from the top, not only block the shot, keep the ball in play, and ignite the fast break. And you can just see with this young guy, I mean, you're talking two quality people in Raheem and in Rodgers. Uh, really, Vancouver and the Knicks right now, when you look at it, this, with, with this pick this late in the draft and just listening to him articulate his feelings about basketball and what takes place outside of the lines, they've got themselves a young man who's probably going to play hard for 82 games. You got that right. Vancouver with a couple of picks, and they've done well. So have the Cleveland Cavaliers, and Mike Fratello is standing by with our Cheryl Miller at Gundarina, the czar and the divine Miss M. Take it away. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Ernie. Well, Coach, it looks like you have an international flavor with their two picks, Ilagaskis and Potapinko. What was the motivation behind going with two big men? Cheryl, on our board of needs going into this draft, the first two things up there were size and toughness that we wanted to add to this team. And I think it's obvious that we've added size, one player being seven foot three and the other weighing in at 277 pounds. And Potapenko is one tough hombre. So I think we've got a little bit of both in there. You ready to pronounce those names and get it straight this time? We'll have to give them short <laughs> nicknames, obviously. <laughs> All right, Coach, congratulations to two picks. Let's go back to you, Ernie. All right, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Mike. Let's go to the podium. The next pick belongs to the Denver Nuggets. Here's the commissioner. With the 23rd pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Denver Nuggets select Ephthymius Regius from Pauk in Greece. As Rick Pitino pointed out a little while ago, Greece is taking center stage on the international scale here as far as making moves into the NBA. Your thoughts on uh, Rencius? Well, I think I think this this is a great pick for them. Obviously, that Michael has done his homework, and you have to go then and do your homework. He sat out last year, and uh, you know this is a, something that that I think that you look at. The Nuggets are going to get themselves a fine basketball player here. Uh, Michael got two, and now Denver Nuggets get one. So they've all done their, their homework with the foreign players. Well, he's only 20 years of age. He's 250 pounds. He runs well, good score, and in the Junior uh, World Championships, led his team to the championship. And the thing that you like uh, is you're trying to protect yourself. Sure, he's not going to be a starter, but you're worrying about can you keep Alonzo Mourning at that position who's a free agent? And then... You know, it's going to be Mark, interesting. Dikembe Dikembe Mutombo. Mutombo. I'm sorry, Dikembe Mutombo. What a, what a, and Sedakovic is his backup, so you're getting a lot of you're getting a lot of yeah. guys piled up there. Do you think the Denver feeling is that Mutombo will not be around? Well, I think that it's going to be difficult for them to keep him uh, in in the early going. Uh, let's just hope, you know, for the franchise's sake, that they can keep him there because he is such a major factor and such a force in not only the shot blocking but the rebounding. The Los Angeles Lakers are up next, and there's so much talk about the fact that they might be able to get their hooks into Shaquille O'Neal. There was talk about a, a draft up and trying to get Eric Marbury. Uh, there I went again, calling Stefan Marbury Eric, but uh, they're up next at the number 24, and where do you go if you're Jerry West? Well, more than likely, we're not going to know the person Jerry's drafting. He's going to confuse <laughs> yeah. us all, and then we're going to have to go to Peter Vesey down with Greg Sega to find out who he's picking. But I, I think I think he's not. He's going to go with somebody big. 
obviously, because if he does go after Shaq, trades Vladi Divac, he's going to need somebody to back him up. And, uh, you know, you have Travis Knight still out there. Uh, so, you know, he may go He may go with him. You know, we've had one trade tonight, and that has been the Stephon Marbury and Ray Allen. And uh, let's go to them now, standing by with Craig Sager. Craig? Well, here one minute, traded the next. That's life in the NBA. I guess you're finding out in a heck of a hurry, Stephon. You had the one hat on. You've been traded to Minnesota. But I know deep down you're awfully happy. You get to play with Kevin Garnett. Have you talked to anybody on the phone to, to pick one the trade were announced? Yeah, I just now spoke to him. I mean, he, he was just as happy as I was. He was screaming. You know, I mean, I'm really happy. I can't say too much about it. I'm getting to play with my friend. Um, we're getting to play where I wanted to play, and I'm going to be surrounded around a great uh, bunch of people as far as the staff. When the trade was announced, did your mom start crying all over again? <laughs> no, nah, she did. She just was, like, shocked. You know, <laughs> now that I'm playing with Kevin, and knowing that she knows Kevin, you know, she feels even better. Congratulations. First of all, Ray, the pick was made. You were surprised. I was a little bit surprised. I told you they loved you in Milwaukee. Have you talked to the Bucks since the trade was announced? Uh, yes, I just finished talking to him, and they're very excited and, and ready for me to come to Milwaukee tomorrow. What about the emotions of waiting to figure out where you're picked, then you're surprised, then you're traded? What was it like for you? Well, uh, it's kind of it's nerve-wracking, going back and forth, thinking you might play on this side of the United States, or then you might think you have an idea of going to Canada. But otherwise, for me, I tried to just uh, stay low-key about it and wait for this night to happen so I can get a better feeling and understand where I'd end up. Well, at this point in time, Ernie, I think we have to say it's a great trade for both guys and both teams. They both got what they wanted. All right, thank you very much, Craig. As we continue in the first round, the number 24 pick belonging to the Los Angeles Lakers. And will Jerry West get somebody that we have never heard of? Who knows if he will do that? Uh, you know, last year, he's gotten Nick Van Exel before. He took Frankie King last year. That didn't exactly pan out. Let us go to our Pacific Division correspondent once again, Scott Hastings in Phoenix. Scotty? Ernie, the answer to Jerry West's dilemma, who he drafts next, is in this book right here, You Choose. I had a chance to cover this team. This team is probably trying to make more trades than any team so far on draft day and leading up to the draft. Nothing has panned out yet. This is a team at the end of the season that did not get along with each other in the locker room. So not only is Jerry West looking for talent, Jerry West, I believe, is going to be looking for chemistry and the right kind of guy that could come in there, fit in, and maybe smooth the waters a little bit. Ernie? All right, thank you, Scott. In Phoenix, covering the Pacific Division and specifically this trip, the Los Angeles Lakers, who have the number 24 pick, and the clock is winding down. Where do you go, Hubie Brown, if you're Jerry West? And again, bring up the team chemistry thing, the Van Exel and Sabalos and everything last year, and uh, it was not a pretty scene. No, it wasn't, but they still won 53 games. It was still an excellent basketball team. Jerry West will pick the best talent. Uh, you know, uh, when you're talking about general managers who can really evaluate people, just go back through this guy's track record ever since he's been in this position and see the talented guys that he's been able to get at the bottom of the draft. Let's jump down now to Peter Vesey. Your thoughts, Pete? Okay, I look for the Lakers to take Jerome Williams or Brian Evans right here, but I think even more importantly, I just talked to someone over at the Knicks. They did definitely are not take, they did definitely did not take those three guys to trade them. They're keeping all three. They think it's added scoring, versatility, athleticism, everything that they need. Plus, they've got $9.4 million left on their cap to spend on free agents this summer. All right, so the Los Angeles Lakers are up. Let's see what direction they go. Here's the commissioner. With the 24th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Los Angeles Lakers select Derek Fisher from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Now, you see, once again, now everyone is sitting here saying, now who is this kid? This guy did a great job in Chicago. All right, we're talking about a guy who can make the plays. He's left-handed. He gets down inside. He has an excellent decision maker. Uh, you can see right now he's only 6'1 and a half, but look at the size, 200 pounds. Good point guard, good decision, left-handed, quick off the dribble, and uh, I thought he did an excellent job at Chicago where he stepped up and made everyone notice his game. And, and you knew it was going to be an Arkansas Little Rock type basketball player last year, Western Carolina. You knew Jerry was going to do this to us. Uh, but certainly, you're right. This is not really a sleeper. This is a young man who's performed well all season long. 
played outstanding basketball for Arkansas Little Rock and, and really can do it. He's a left-handed that can play this game. Player of the year in the Sun Belt Conference, and some say may remind you a little bit of the little general, Avery Johnson of the San Antonio Spurs. So he is picked. Derek Fisher is by the L.A. Lakers. Utah up next at 25. We'll be back. Welcome back to the 1996 NBA Draft. Let's go back a few years to 1993 when Chris Webber was the number one pick by the Orlando Magic, but then was traded for Anthony Hardaway, the number three pick. So another swapping of hats, much as we had tonight between the number four and number five, Stephon Marbury and Ray Allen. We welcome you back to the draft. We are through 24 picks. The number 25 selection belongs to the Utah Jazz. Never quite there, getting over the hump, although they uh, they make it to the Western Conference Finals. And I don't know what the missing ingredient is there, where you look on a night like this when you're picking 25 in the first round. No, you're just trying to get a talented player. Let's face it, you look at the Jazz last year, and they added two guys over seven foot at the center positions. Uh, they came with uh, Morris as a free agent who stepped in and gave them double figures. So it is a team that became much bigger and much stronger. And if John Stockton's health was not questionable in that Seattle series, they could have very easily been in the finals. And if they would have made some open J's, they could possibly have been in the final. The Utah Jazz are up. Let's go to the commissioner for their pick, number 25 in the first round. With the 25th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Utah Jazz, in this most international of leagues, select Martin Mursep from Kalev Tallinn, Estonia. You know, with an intro like that, <laughs> you knew something was up when the commissioner said in this most international of drafts. And Martin Mursep from Estonia, 6'9", 238. That's all I know. Do you guys know more on him? Well, uh, this would be a perfect time after the commercial to go to write to Peter Vesey to find out the inside. <laughs> the, Martin, the Martin Mursep story with Peter Vesey. <laughs> Next, as the NBA draft continues here from Continental Airlines Arena. Thanks for being here tonight, folks. We'll be right back. Back at you from New Jersey as the draft continues on TNT. 1973, nice look. Doug Collins, the number one pick. The gritty, gutty Doug Collins, now the head coach of the Detroit Pistons. And they are up next as the fanfare continues here at Continental Airlines Arena. We have much more now on Martin Yersap. He's 6'9", 238. We joke because they're not volumes and volumes written about this guy. But I tell you what, if you were at breakfast this morning and you saw Hubie Brown walking around in his George Murison t-shirt, you understand what the draft is all about. This is a land of opportunity. And you remember guys laughing about George Murison from Romania saying, I love this game and what a player he's turned out to be. He is a definite force in this league. He anchors that young Washington team. When you think of the improvement that he has made through hard work, great attitude, very coachable. You know, that's what this is all about. And now they you, you just you can't get this guy. I mean, when you just think two years ago, everybody was saying, oh, my gosh, he can't change ends. He can't do this. Well, he's just proven everyone wrong because it's difficult to get into that painted area when you play the Washington Wizards. So perhaps Utah still has a shot of uh, at Martin Mursep being another George Murison. And there is Jerome Williams of Georgetown, a talent who remains in the green room waiting, and we are at the Detroit portion of the telecast. Doug Collins, what's he looking for, Hubie? Well, you have to look at it this way. Uh, Otis Storp, a free agent. His starting center, Don Reed, a free agent. The backups, Eric Lechner, Lou Rowe, all free agents. These are front court people. You could possibly lose four guys. Jerome Williams is the type of guy that he's looking for. 6'9", runner, defender, excellent rebounder, good defense, can finish on the break. Limited offensive game, but they got that plus 18 this year because of players like this. Doug Collins and the Detroit Pistons with the 26th pick in the first round. Let's go to Commissioner David Stern.
with the 26th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Detroit Pistons select Jerome Williams from Georgetown University. Just the words he was waiting to hear to get out of that green room and get out here in the arena. Well, Detroit had a big decision there. You have Jerome Williams, you had Othello Harrington, both the same type of game, power forward, small forward. They also could have gone big for a center, but then again, not an athletic center. The type of guy that they're, the type of style of play that they're trying to play with their front guard people. Uh, everyone loves this guy. He, he's a bundle of enthusiasm and an excellent defender. How much does it come into play that a coach will say, I went with Don Reed out of Georgetown last year. I love what I got from this second round pick. I like this Georgetown product. Does that, does that sway you that way in a pick like Jerome Williams? Well, I, I think what you see in the workouts. Jerome Williams from high school on has been a young man with a tremendous threshold for work. And if you you're a coach at this pick. You want somebody, when you take Grant Hill out of the game, who's going to walk for you, and that's what they got with this young man. The MVP at the Desert Classic, one of the camps in Phoenix, by which uh, scouts are able to judge talent, had 12 steals in that tournament, fourth in the Big East and rebounding with nearly nine a game, and he finds a way to score. Yeah, I, no, I, I like his game. He's a slasher. And the big thing is when you're, when you're picking down at this spot, you're trying to find athletic guys who can come in, defend for you, and possibly play two positions. And then in the transition game, because they like to take their defense, and if you, if you go back and look at Detroit this year, they were one of the top defensive teams that we had in the NBA. And I know that's what Doug is doing. Good, young, talented guys who can give you two positions and lead with the defense. Let's go to the inside look now on Jerome Williams of Georgetown and uh, what he brings to the table for Doug Collins, guys, the versatility and Jerome Williams, according to Hubie Brown, folks. Well, you can just see right now, first of all, he winks. He does a good job when he's <laughs> winking. And now just watch him come up over the top of three people in order to keep the ball alive. Now, once that he gets, you know that he has the athletic quickness to kick and then fill a lane. And you're going to see at the other end, he will get the ball back and then finish in the painted area. And this is the type of, of Dennis Rodman type athlete that you love on, from, at the, with the offensive glass. This is a young man that's very versatile running the floor, and he's someone who can pound the offensive backboard. And you take Rand Hill, who's not going to rest too much, and you give him 40 <laughs> minutes. We saw a sign in the arena a little while ago. Jerome is in the house. He is indeed, and he's with Greg Sutton. Well, at Georgetown, Allen Iverson grabbed the headlines. You grabbed all the rebounds. How has your confidence risen since the season ended? Well, you know, after the Desert Classic, you know, my confidence rose a bit um, getting the MVP out there. I just looked to work hard and play basketball. Um, I got to thank God, thank my parents for giving me the opportunity, Georgetown University for giving me the opportunity to play at their school. Um, I'm just very happy to be in the situation I'm in right now. I talked to you in the green room earlier tonight. You said you went to 11 schools, but I didn't hear you mention Detroit. No, you know, Detroit is one of the teams that uh, they have such a great chemistry going right now. Um, I got my good friend Grant Hill and Don Reed there. You know, I can't, I can't be happier at this point, you know, just to be able to play with an up-and-coming star like Grant Hill and be in the nucleus of an um, up-and-coming or back, back to becoming a great organization in, in Detroit. New coach Doug Collins, I think it's going to be great. When I think of Georgetown, I think of a great work ethic. That's the same thing I think of when I think of Doug Collins with the Pistons, so it should be a good fit. Ernie? Thank you very much, Craig. Back with more on the NBA Draft from the Continental Airlines Arena. That pretty much says it all. It's the 1996 NBA Draft. Pick number 27 belongs to the Magic. Commissioner David Stern. With the 27th pick in the 1996 NBA Draft, the Orlando Magic select Brian Evans from Indiana University. This guy can stroke it, Brian Evans from Indiana. It was beginning to look like for the first time since 1975 there would not be a Big Ten selection in the first round, but Brian Evans has seen, the, seen his way past that, the Indiana Hoosier. 
pick number 27 by the Orlando Magic. And Hubie, we mentioned he's a good shooter. How good? Yeah, he's a good three-point shooter. He led the Big Ten in rebounding. He's a very intelligent player. I thought in Chicago he showed his wares. People say, well, he might be a little soft defensively. But the main thing is, is that he can board, he can finish, and he can spot up and shoot the threes. The main thing when you join Orlando as a front court guy, you must be able to hit the perimeter shot. Yubi, I'll be honest with you, I didn't think this young man could play in the NBA, but toward the end of the season, when you watch him develop and you watch his perimeter game as well as his rebounding game, you say if he's drafted by the right team, where someone named Shaquille O'Neal could protect him if he gets beat defensively. And then this young man also, like Nick Anderson, stops all the double downs from occurring because of his great outside shooting. He's with the perfect team to make it. I was going to say, uh, all Orlando needs is another guy who can fill it up from three-point range with Dennis Scott and Nick Anderson down there. He had 28 points against your bunch. Will he have some trouble getting his shot off, do you think, Hubie? Well, I, I think that comes down to the type of offenses that you run. You know that he's coming out of a, a system uh, where everything is schooled and you're really you know you're getting your doctorate's degree and how to read screens and that and I know he'll do that but down in Orlando the key is is when they throw into Shaq when they throw into Penny Hardaway when they throw in a Nick Anderson they all get double teamed all you have to do is catch the ball on the way back and put it in the basket simple as that Brian Evans goes to the Orlando Magic the 27th pick in the first round of the NBA draft let's check in again with our Atlantic Division correspondent now Kevin Kiley in Philly take it away Kev Ernie, thank you very much. I keep hearing the word Shaq when they throw it into Shaq, and of course that is Orlando's main consideration. Will Shaq be there? He's a free agent. Will they be able to throw it into him? There's been a lot of talk about Shaquille's relationship with Brian Hill. Well, according to the information I have, that is not a factor. What is a factor is there is some jealousy and some competition over endorsements between Shaquille O'Neal and Penny Hardaway, and that is one of the reasons that Shaquille is considering leaving. Also, their uh, their agents, the Poston brothers represent Penny, and Leonard Armato represents Shaquille O'Neal. They do not like each other, so there is a developing situation in Orlando between the two superstars. Shaquille feels that Penny is more popular. Now, I was in Orlando and I didn't see that during the playoffs. So that development still has to come about, and we'll see after the draft whether Shaquille stays in Orlando. Back to you, Ernie. Oh, a few nuggets to munch on there from Kevin Kiley <laughs> in Philadelphia. Let's go down to the commissioner now. Atlanta has the 28th pick in a trade with Seattle. With the 28th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Atlanta Hawks select Priest Lauderdale from Central State Ohio University and Peristeri in Greece. The Atlanta Hawks, as things stood, had two picks in the second round. They swap with Seattle. They give those two to the Sonics. They move up to 28 in the first round. And Priest Lauderdale, this guy is 7-4. Reports were 343. I don't know if he's tipping it at that, but <laughs> this guy's a load, Ruby. Well, you know, what the Hawks are telling you is they're trying to get someone at that center position along with Rooks that can make a contribution so that Christian Leitner can move over to the power position. You have Grant Long, and you also have Alan Henderson, all guys who had excellent years. This guy only played 13 games in college before he went overseas to play. But you are absolutely right. This guy is what a size. <laughs> 343 pounds. <laughs> he played his high school ball in Chicago at Carver. That's where Tim Hardaway played his high school ball. Played one year at Central States of Ohio for Kevin Porter, and then he went to Greece. You take a look at him in action. Well, I think at this number, this is a good gamble. Certainly, you have a big man to work with, and as we all know, big men get better in the NBA, which steadily improving each year they're out. Shows a good turnaround hook shot in the lane. 
You know, that hooping and hollering I just heard, I think, came from the home of Christian Leitner, who said, hey, I'm not a center anymore. Is this going to move him down? You think if he's going to hang around? Priest Lauderdale, chosen by the Atlanta Hawks, 28th in the first round, and the Priest is with a sake, right? Well, Ernie, sometimes we have people in the green room that we interview. This time we got somebody out of the stands. You came here on your own, not one of the invitees. Why would you come to the draft? Now does it feel to be the number one pick? I came to the draft, you know, because I want to support my peers, you know, and there's a lot of guys here I know, and um, I felt I deserved to be here. What about going to Greece? What was the decision made? What were the factors? How did that affect your game? Um, it really just gave me an opportunity to shine on a higher level, you know, because uh, playing at an NAI, you know, people tend to think, you know, there's not, not as much competition or people are not as good. But, you know, Greece just gave me a chance to profile myself on a higher level. Are you going to play for Lenny Wilkins now? You're going for the best. Uh, I just want to tell him thank you for the opportunity and um, play real hard for him in the city in Atlanta. Congratulations. Back to the set. Lenny Wilkins on his way to the Walmart to pick up a new scale because <laughs> Freeze Lauderdale <laughs> is a big one, 343. Let's go down now to Peter Vesey. Peter, what's up? Ernie, sources have told me that the Charlotte Hornets have traded Kobe Bryant to the Lakers. The best confirmation that I could get out of the Lakers was that we're very interested in Kobe, but we have not made a deal yet. We might see this be a small deal for maybe Anthony Peeler, or it could escalate into something big involving Vlade Divac. Back to you. Okay, we'll stay on top of that. Uh, Kobe Bryant possibly going from Charlotte to the Los Angeles Lakers. Intriguing stuff. One more pick to go in the first round. It belongs to the champion Chicago Bulls. We'll be back right after this.